who's not doing well. YouTube is an addiction. It's an addiction. You're in show business, we're not. That's just different. I would hope that feels different. Brands are gonna have to shift up the way that they do brand deals soon. Do you remember the amount? Well, can I tell you something that's insane? Oh, shit. Like, that's a lot. Would you ever act? Actually, I don't think I've ever told the story. Is there anything you would change? I'm excited to get into this. <laughs> Today on The Colin and Tamir Show, we're joined by Emma Chamberlain. Now, this is actually the first time that we've met Emma, but it really didn't feel like that. And that's because Emma's unique ability is to be exactly who she is on camera. From 2017 to 2021, she uploaded for 55 months straight, an average of four videos per month, making her one of the main faces of the platform. Since then, Emma has posted a lot less frequently, and this year alone, she's only uploaded three videos. In this interview, we talked to her about why that is, and if she ever plans on coming back to YouTube. We also talk about her current projects, like her exclusive podcast deal with Spotify for Anything Goes, her partnerships in the fashion world, as well as how she's pioneering the creator-led brand movement with Chamberlain Coffee. All right, here's our interview with Emma Chamberlain. Emma, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I was thinking about this on the way in. Uh, I was like, we are sitting here making a YouTube video together. I know. We're collabing. We're totally doing um, yeah, a collab. Yeah. My first and, collab in a long time. Yeah. And I was thinking, I was like, you don't, the, the thought that came to my mind was like, you don't come here often anymore. I meaning know. YouTube. <laughs> Not, I know. Well, how does it, like, what is your relationship to YouTube right now? I feel like it's a loving relationship. It's not like an ex that you hate at all. But I, like, I have such a, a deep love for YouTube but such a complex relationship with it. It's like, I love it so much and I wish it, I wish that our relationship clicked for me right now, but it doesn't. But I love to be here when I'm here. Mm. And it, so it, it's very sweet, I would say. Do you feel like when you're watching YouTube now, you're watching from an insider's perspective or do you feel more so outside looking in these days? Maybe I'm completely delusional, but it still feels like I'm in it. Yeah. I think once you are in it deep once, you're in it forever mm. in a way. You can never escape it. Like it changed my brain. Totally. I will never see the platform the same. I don't yeah. think. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I I, uh, I was watching your Met Gala again video, and I was thinking about the different eras of your creative output on the, on the platform. Mm. And after I watched that video, I went back and watched your first video that's on your channel, oh, as God. well as your first video ever, which is on Billy Billy, a Chinese <laughs> version of YouTube. Do you know that? Really? Yeah. City, summer, summer City Lookbook, whatever oh, it's called, God. is on Billy Billy. Uh, someone re-uploaded it. Oh my God, I hope the, it has three views. <laughs> and not, Slightly uh, more no, than that. It, it has no! more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than that. You're, big no! in, you're really big in China. Yes, yeah. that's amazing. Oh my God. But it's just that one video. That's it. Just that yeah. one. That's all they know you By about. the yeah. way, that video is iconic. Yeah. I was trend History. starting. Yeah, no, I wasn't. It was weird. I, but I was thinking, like, from the first video to to now, you did have this like unbelievable confidence to speak to a lens, and that that stayed true throughout your different eras, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's it's been such an interesting thing to witness you go through creative evolution, and like having us as people who have loved YouTube for a long time and watched you for a long time watch you evolve. What what evolution? are you in right now? Like, where are we at in the Emma Chamberlain timeline? I'm trying to pinpoint it myself because I think what's happening is creatively, I'm due for a shift, but one bigger than I had ever experienced prior. Like, I'm really hungry for something really different. And I think that that was somewhat clear with my last few videos that were a bit more, I don't know what you, word to use, artsy. <laughs> like, yeah. They, you know, they, they were a bit more cinematic, if you could even say that. Like, it, they were more about creating a feeling, I think, than anything. 
But then that didn't work for me long term because that format didn't allow my personality to come out and I felt like my personality wasn't coming out anymore. And so that was the most recent phase. That worked for a second. Now it's not working simultaneously. I'm an adult now and my brain is so different. It is so different. It could not be more different. I feel like I'm, I feel like there's been 20 years between the beginning of my career and now. It, it, I don't remember my life before this. It feels like it's been hundreds of years almost. And not being sure what the next creatively fulfilling thing will be combined with the uncertainty of who I am as an adult, it's, there's a whole lot of question marks. To me, it's exciting. Like I'm not worried about it, but what I've figured out is that I cannot rush it. You know, this industry is like obsessed with speed. It's about speed. Mm -hmm. It's about being present. It's about being visible. And I need to pull back in a way that everyone will look and be like, well, she's quitting. And I have to be okay with that. Mm. I know that I can't be a vlogger forever. I just can't. And I don't want to do that. And I think in order to, dis to, to figure out what the next thing is, I have to give myself that time to figure it out. Sometimes I think it's funny that, you know, even what you mentioned around like, people take it as you quit. Like you are extremely present right now. You yeah. are in video form on Spotify. Yeah. Once a week at a minimum, Yeah. right? It's twice you, a week. Twice a week. Twice I'm a committed week. Yeah, to you, two a week. You have the interviews yeah. and you have your solo show. You are very present on Instagram or at like, fashion events, yeah. like you are a very present person. Yeah. But it's amazing that it feels like you've, like you're not as present. Uh, and, and it might just be that vlogging and YouTube mm -hmm. had a different, it, it holds a different space in on the internet. Yes. There's something too about like clicking on a video of yours and you're looking at us in the face, right? That's true. It's like, yes. Which is like from almost another era ago, actually, when you were doing that really yeah. consistently. But yeah, that feeling when as a viewer is like, oh, she's here. Yeah. And as very YouTube native people too, we're like, yeah. okay, yeah, like, yeah, she's here. My initial um, group of followers, you know, the people who have been following me since day one are used to interacting with me in a very particular way. And that is not happening anymore. So it makes complete sense that they're like, where are you? Mm. Because I'm there, but in a very different way. I used to be open about my life in a different way. I, I would say my level of vulnerability is the same in my eyes and in my core, you know, I feel that. But again, it's different. It's like now on my podcast, I'm sharing more of the inner workings of my brain. Whereas on YouTube, I was vulnerable in a much more surface level way, I would say. It, it felt more vulnerable though, because the things that I was talking about was maybe more embarrassing or shocking or loud. It was like the vulnerability was screaming mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Whereas now I think my vulnerability is is whispering a bit more, but I'm also protecting myself a bit more yeah. because I've learned that that's something I need for my own well-being. And so that's another thing. So It's not like it's absent though. Like in the Met Gala again video, mm -hmm. the, one of the most amazing scenes in that is when you're in the bathroom the night before. Mm -hmm and you're talking about your schedule the next day, and then you pull out the tampons and mm -hmm. you start talking about <laughs> mm -hmm. just like the pale blue dress. And there is this like, I, I just really don't know how you deliver to a camera like that because it really feels like, I mean, we hung out for half an hour or an hour before we started recording, yeah. like that is you. Yeah. I don't know how you are that real in front of a camera. I don't know if you've ever seen this clip, but we interviewed Mr. Beast and asked him about you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was like, I can't do that. Yeah. Like that is, that is a different thing. And, and I really think you introduced that in a way that is, mm -hmm. it's unparalleled. Like I haven't seen another person be able to be that themselves 
Thank you. Just by yourself in a room with a camera. I don't, I, I don't know how, I don't know what it is. Like I, it's so weird to me because I think this is a complete conspiracy theory about, about Emma. About okay? yourself. Right. So here I we go. Yeah. Um, I've noticed a lot of my friends growing up sort of put on almost a facade for their parents in a way. Understandably so. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents have unrealistic expectations, um, are, can be judgmental, uh, can be controlled, like whatever. A lot of kids don't feel safe to like be themselves around their parents because parents, again, high expectations. And so there's a pressure to sort of pretend to be more of a picture perfect sort of person than you are. This is not everybody, yeah. but majority of my friends had that experience growing up. I didn't have that. I had such a unique environment growing up that I've wondered if showing my imperfections to my parents, and my parents were my first best friends, and I just, I grew up in this environment where it was so safe to share anything. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. so safe. So I've never had this, like, I almost feel more comfortable putting it all out on the table. I'm like a chronic oversharer in real life as well. And I have two drinks and it's actually like, <laughs> and then it's really, really bad. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm at the bar and like everyone knows about everything I've ever experienced in my life. It's bad. Um, that happened to me two weekends ago and I have not had a drink since. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I feel more comfortable sharing everything almost and being so myself because it makes me feel like less of an imposter. I'm not afraid that people are later gonna find out that I'm something else. It, it makes me feel, if everything's out on the table and they see everything, then it, it nobody will turn on me. Like that's kind of how it Let works. Let me ask you a question yeah. from a guy who's married to a therapist. Yeah. What is your relationship to rejection? Did you have a relationship with rejection growing up or even with validation? Because to me, that sounds like almost a fending off of rejection where it's like, it is. here's everything. So you can't even pick one thing and yes. reject it. Mm. That's what it is. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because I don't know, I think it started in middle school, high school. And I, I was always like, somewhat in like the cool kid group, but I was always probably the least cool or considered the least cool by the, by the kids, right? It's ruthless. And I was like a, I was always a small ch child. I was small and I went through puberty super late and I, the, I think it came, this is so embarrassing and I, and I don't know if this is what it is, but I think me always being the last choice for the boys ruined me. And it, it, not really, it didn't ruin me, but it, it, it informed, it, it informed yeah. me. It, it, it impacts all areas of my life. It's so fascinating that boys not choosing me, it like could have that profound I, of an impact. I'd love I, to know yeah, like, connect what's, on that, what's sure. the, difference between at that time when you're an open book to boys in your school and you're an open book to your parents in terms of the reaction? Like the difference between... Like how they respond. Yeah, see, it's it's ironic too because it's always been polarizing, right? Some guys throughout my life, some guys are like, oh, obsessed, I get it. And they get it and they're like, whoa. Some guys are like, have some class. Like, who are you? Like, they can't, they don't get it, which is fine. You know, like it's, but it's, it's one or the other. It's never like, oh, friendship wise, it's great. Like, I think most people like friendship wise. For sure, totally. Love an open book. Of course. But when it comes to, Dating, it, it's it's either love me or like hate me. 
Yeah, I. Uh, it's so interesting because I was that also. Like I was last choice for the girls mm -hmm. in my, it, when I was growing up, mm -hmm. and it. it I ask that question because I find that people who choose to do this thing that we do, they have some relationship with either rejection or um, valid, like looking to protect themselves or find validation in a space that they can control. Oh, I'm also the a control freak in a way that you've never. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's because you were kind of, at least for me, I was kind of out of control of I felt out of control of the way people perceived me or the way, mm -hmm. you know, once you're in high school and you go from, I went to from seventh grade to 12th grade with the same group of kids. Whatever happens yeah. in seventh grade, you're locked in, right? Oh, yeah. You're locked in, right? Yeah. So that's just, you can't get out of that. Yeah. And so as a creative, when you recognize that you have the power to create and in this era that we arrived in of, you can actually create your own image, mm -hmm. that became very attractive to anyone who had that experience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's why I ask is like, I can, I, I connect to you on that. It's um, all there. Yeah. It's proof is in the pudding. Right. Yeah. There is a, I, I went to, to film school. So I'm mm -hmm. like a hyper analyst when it comes to film. And I'd say Colin and I are a hyper analyst when it comes to Emma Chamberlain videos. Oh uh, my God. That's and, the yeah. greatest compliment. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's an era of your videos mm -hmm. of the like when you started doing the like single word titles and the oh, yeah. like, alterations was the first yeah. one. Yes, alterations. Yes, there's yeah. a major shift. Bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thumbnails have... went from being like graphic designed to yeah. not. Yeah. yeah, intros went from you being like, "Hi, good morning." Yeah, to maybe no intro yeah. until yep. or thirty seconds of no talking. Two yeah. minutes in, sometimes I have a like a film school analysis of that that I'm curious if is is your perspective. Tell me everything. So that happened at a time as you're like becoming an adult, right? Yes. And the voyeuristic nature of those videos, right? The camera is distant, but observing you, is representative of the ever-present third person that you created in your life, which yes. is the audience. That is hyper-analyzing your every move and always present, even if at a distance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's I mean, it. great. But you know what's interesting about Satisfying that? Satisfying to hear that, because I was like, what if she goes, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. No, but it-, it It's was... not that deep. <laughs> it's just a cool shot, dude. Yeah. Yeah. There was a ledge there and the yeah. camera just fit on top. I just bought my first real tripod. Yeah. I was yeah. trying it so, out. <laughs> chill out. No, it's interesting that you say that because it's such an accurate read, but it happened in such a subconscious way. It like, almost felt to me like you were like, like you had no choice, but you had let these people into your house and you're like, fine, I'm just gonna live my life, but <laughs> yeah. you can watch because yeah. that's what I've signed up for now. Totally. Right? Totally. There were a lot of comments during that time that were like, she's filming like she's the last person on earth. <laughs> I kind of felt like that during that time. But yeah. I guess that was like COVID, was COVID still, yeah, that was a lot true. of time at home. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. But it was definitely like a really, I mean, I think it's pretty clear to anyone who's watching. I wasn't a particularly happy girl. Right. Like, but I think I had gotten to a point where I felt like I couldn't really say that anymore. Like I felt like it, uh, vulnerability at one point was about all things. At one point was what people really liked about me. But I had gotten to this point where People didn't want to hear that from me anymore. They were like, you're depressed. You don't get to be depressed anymore. Like, yeah. you, which I understand, by the way, I understand that perspective because if you haven't experienced, you know, like mm, car a career success in that way, you would assume that that would solve a lot of problems and that there wouldn't be room for upset anymore. People started to say, that I was like, f anytime I would talk about, say like a mental health struggle or whatever, it was either, I mean, there was still some support of course, but it became, you're lying for, to like, you're be basically being fake relatable. Mm. Uh, or you just, you don't, you're not allowed to feel that way anymore because you've reached a level of success and now you're not allowed to feel that anymore. But then during this time that we're referring to now, I was not doing well. 
Like I was pretty depressed and I couldn't say that anymore. But then at the same time, I, I, I was sick of like doing like a video where I go and try to run a marathon in one day or like I, you know, like a challenge or something that's sort of more concept based. Like that was so unfulfilling for me. It, it just felt fake and useless to me. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And it's not fun for me. I just, I can't. And I always try to cut things off right when they're not fun anymore, right? So it was not fun anymore. So it was like, it was this really bizarre time for me where I just didn't know what to do, but yet I didn't want to stop. So I was like, you're in my house. Like, and it's not going to be funny yeah. because I'm not funny right now. It's not going to be, it might actually be really fucking boring, but that's all I got. I haven't watched them in a long time, but I'm, I'm thinking about them now and it was an emo vibe. It was, it was an a emo great, vibe. It was a great I mean, vibe. It was a great vibe, probably from they two. They were fun though. From two, it was also like, two emo kids. It was, yeah, yeah from know, two like emo two kids, emo we were kids. in. We enough. were one hot topic kid yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, were, <laughs> we were bought in enough to make a film critique of it and yeah. talk about how much we loved Honored. it. Honored, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think when you make that shift at that time on YouTube and you leave space, silence at times. Yes. And you're not spoon feeding the audience the concept yes. of I'm running a marathon or I'm sleeping on my balcony for 24 hours. Yeah. You also leave gaps where the audience now has to work mm. and try and interpret yes. what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. Man, when, you have this great quote from your podcast mm -hmm. uh, that I listened to on my way into work one day. It's, it was said, um, good creative doesn't beg for your attention. Mm -hmm. Yes. It, like that quote mm -hmm. shook me. Yeah. Because that's almost the antithesis to how people make YouTube videos today. Yeah. And, and it's, and I'm so glad to see that shift happening because I think the sort of quick, fast, hot, trendy content is, I mean, that's like, that's a creative art form in its own. Mm. I mean, trust me, that is, but I'm at a place now where I'm like, I want to provide something that makes people think in a way that's positive. Like I want to help people's brains, you know, to me, slowing things down does that in a way. And I think we're all kind of getting to a point where things being so fast and so dramatic and so like, you know, like whatever has altered this, our attention spans in a lot of ways. You know, it's, a, it's altered the, the way that we consume content. We're, we're having a harder time sitting down and watching something that's a bit slower. I, I think it's not just attention spans, but it's yeah. our appetite for sensationalism. That's very true. That's Wh very true. Which is the most troubling to me. I think what makes something interesting now, mm -hmm. the, the the stakes that are required to make yes. something interesting, the um, there's a, a comedian, Andrew Schultz. Mm -hmm. You know him? He mm -hmm. said that right now what works is a car crash. Yes. Which yes. is like, and, and then you think about it, if you're running a media company and you're trying to get people to watch stuff, like the level of sensationalism you have to get to to capture someone's attention, it's not just speed, it's also subject matter. You're right. And it's actually it, more that it, now It's than more realizing. subject yeah. matter. And I think that's the most troubling is that we have an appetite for subject matter that's dark, mm -hmm. that's twisted, that's scary, that's mm -hmm. like, and we are swiping through it or scrolling through it at a yeah. rapid pace. We're numb. We're numb yeah. to it. Oh, and because it's like our bar keeps raising for exactly. what, what is interesting or what is capturing our, our attention at the moment. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you stop? You said like, I didn't want to stop. I would imagine that's a, a great time to stop. I know. I know you both know this. YouTube is an addiction. It's an addiction. And I didn't stop because I was fully addicted to YouTube. Like we, we become addicted to YouTube, I think in part because it's our jobs, it becomes our jobs, you know what I mean? Like for us, it's, it's, 
it's our job. It's clocking in, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's identity. But it, that's a whole yeah. huge part of it, it is. And I, I believed for a long time that if I stopped posting on YouTube, my career was over. My career was over, which was not something that necessarily scared me. I've gone through phases, but I'm not, like that is not the end of the world to me. Like if everything went away, I, I've become comfortable with that idea. If everything went away, I would be totally okay. Like I don't need this. I don't need, it's, I enjoy it. I choose to do it. But if for whatever reason it all went away tomorrow, I'd be okay. And I know that. So that's, but that's what's interesting. It's like I kept going because it wasn't just my job. There was another piece. Like it's, I don't know. It's so weird. Like what I is it? I find it to be a mirror. YouTube is a mirror, mm -hmm. right? Like you're like exploring who you are mm -hmm. and you do that through, as a creative, you do that through what comes out of you, right? Mm -hmm. And whatever comes out of you, you look at it and you watch it back and you're like, oh yeah, that's me. Yeah. Then you take another step and you put it out to millions of people and they reflect back to you and you're like, yeah, yeah so that is me. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly looking at like, who am I? And you need to look in the mirror. And as a creative, that's putting stuff out. Yeah. And as a YouTuber, that's publishing. That's that's pressing publish. So I, I think like I've explored this relationship too because I feel very, feel very uncomfortable when we're not publishing. It's an uncomfortable yeah. feeling, right? It's just like in your body. And we've been posting YouTube videos for 12 years together. Yeah. And I don't remember a week where I didn't think about it. Yeah. And so to turn that off is like, how do you, I feel like it's like a crutch and it's comforting to care about something so intensely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even if it's unhealthy at times. Yeah. When it comes to identity, I think to myself, I see myself as someone who yeah. cares really intensely yeah. about what they do, what they make, and what they're putting out. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm uncomfortable and I don't like what it started to build, yeah. I'm like, oh, I gotta keep doing that because that's that's what I do. It's like Part of who I am. It is. I mean, even now, I, I still feel that discomfort inside from not posting. Like every week that goes by, I, f I feel it. But I turned it off and stopped because I had to. I had to. And when I say I had to, I, I unfortunately have no other explanation other than my intuition. And my entire career thus far, I'm in the driver's seat and my intuition is taking me everywhere. Something in my body, though it's, you know, though there's a part of my body that's feeling the discomfort from being out of that hamster wheel, there's a much stronger voice saying, you cannot do this right now. You just can't. You can't. It's, it's not right. It's just not right. And a lot of times my intuition says things that go against what anyone else would tell me to do. Right. Mm -hmm. But that's how I've arrived. I know to trust that instinct. And I, I know why the instinct is telling me that. Like I'm not completely aloof. I, I know why. You have to know when something is done. When you've done everything that can be done and any more would start to be too much. Yeah. Like I, I can't, there's no, we, that's we only- We don't get seasons. Yeah. Right, like we aren't on TV shows that have end dates. Yeah, <laughs> And that's the thing, we also run our own network mm -hmm. that is just there, sitting there, and mm -hmm. we're the programming executive. So like, we don't have that of like, oh, okay, the Emma Chamberlain vlog season is done now. Then yeah. we don't have that infrastructure to decide. Or even being like, and YouTube didn't pick it back up. Yeah. So right. like, yeah. what am I gonna do? There's actually something right. beautiful about that. <laughs> yeah. Of like, oh, they didn't say yes. You know, like. I don't have a choice. Yeah, I don't yeah. have a choice. <laughs> but when you have a choice, it actually haunts you. Haunts. That you're actively making a choice to not. 
Yeah. And that is that is a strange feeling that we deal with as independent creatives. Yep. Um, I'm curious about the relationship to your audience. We talked about this a bit, um, but like from the beginning of this, you know, you are very much the the best friend, right? The internet's best friend. Um, and as you grow into who you are today, like we spent a little time on your subreddit. Mm -hmm. We looked at- <gasps> That's so fucking are, scary. The subreddit's a wild scary place. place. Yeah. I mean, the amount of, yeah. the amount of opinions on you as a human being. I don't even want to know. Yeah, I mean, you should not. I will never. Don't hang yeah, out there. Yeah, it's not I worth it. I will never go on Don't there. hang out there because it's also like, it is just that concept of like this ever present human that is just watching you and thinking about you and commenting about you. And it's, you know, in the beginning of, of your career, I imagine that was like a really exciting thing to develop this relationship with a lot of people who saw you as their best friend. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious your emotional journey through that relationship, because you did build something where people just will watch you do whatever because of their relationship to you. There's a video you made that is like one of the most aspirational YouTube titles and thumbnails, which was, you totally caught me making soup. Which is a great video. It's a, it's a, and even then it was stylistically a little different from what you were yeah. doing at yeah. the time. Yes, it yes. was a like full voiceover for yeah. twelve minutes yeah. about you making the soup. We saw, so, yeah, we saw that title and thumbnail. <laughs> so crazy. It opens yeah. with a shot of peas. Yeah. It was yeah. so like weird. I, I loved it. That I was loved like it. an experimental film on yeah. YouTube, totally. but it has like six or seven million views. And I looked at that, and I and like that is an example I show to people if they don't understand the depth of connection between a YouTube creator and their audience. Yeah. Where you can upload something. If you get to, the, actually, again, you might be unparalleled, but you get to a place where you can upload something called You Totally Caught Me Making Soup, and six million people are interested in that. Well, I can't, for one, I, I think I can't comprehend it. Right. It's very overwhelming. Like, it, it's definitely overwhelming because I feel this immense pressure to provide something to these people who, for whatever reason, I'm getting passionate talking with my hands and bumping everything. <laughs> um, I feel a responsibility to be a good friend, you know? And it is weird because they actually do kind of know me. It's not a, like, it is not a facade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it's it's really unusual. And I don't feel like, oh, I need to act a certain way now. Like I've been at like a party or at like a bar and somebody's come up to me and it's like, you already know me. Like you already know me. Yeah, like I'm doing, like I'm at a party or I'm at a bar, like I'm drinking, I'm in like a different setting that you like never see me in. Like it, but it's still, I don't worry about it because I'm like, because you know me. You're not judging me because you know me. I don't know how to explain it, but it is special in that way. But there's definitely, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Sure, of course. It definitely, because I think also people feel so connected to me that they expect things from me. They expect me to be a certain type of friend to them if you will, and people get really deeply mad at me. Like as though I cut them off. Like it's, it's like cutting off a friend in real life. Yeah. People get, people are currently very mad at me. It sucks. I mean, it's not, I, I, it sucks, but I, I do what I have to do. You know what I mean? Like I, I can't, and hopefully they'll see that I can be a good friend again, just in a different way. And I am a good friend in a different way now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like on my it's, podcast, it's different. It's different, and it's yeah. And some people are like, I don't like that. Totally fine. But then they're like, you're gone because I don't like what you're doing now. And the old thing is, is gone. So you're gone. I lost you as a friend. Fuck you. And it's like, yeah, but aren't good friends supposed to just, you know. Unconditionally. Unconditionally yeah. love, but no. Yeah. yeah. 
think your fan experience is unique, even just because of the time that you became so popular. Like social media and platforms have changed so much. There are so many people who are available to us that we can so consume many, little yeah. parts of on TikTok or uh, Instagram or whatever. Mm -hmm. But back then, like it was, there weren't as many of us and there weren't as many no. platforms. So it was just like, oh yeah, YouTube, Emma, she is like established, she is mm. stamped and there's not much competition on Netflix. There's not much competition on TikTok. Yeah. Of course there are other creators at the time on YouTube. Like there's yeah, great yeah. stuff. Um, but you at that time were like the marquee lifestyle creator and it was like a hit show. So it was more siloed. Now that doesn't happen as much. Like there aren't as many, or there actually there are way more, way more. But, which makes, but there aren't as many yeah. people who are who feel as singular. Mm -hmm. Exa I know exactly what you mean. It's very saturated. Yeah. And I think that's part of why I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Vlogging, for example, it has been. It, it's there's so much of it everywhere. It's so saturated that selfishly and creatively, it's not a way of storytelling that I feel inspired by anymore. I can't, yeah, it, it's just, it's, there's, and by the way, I understand why there's a lot of people vlogging because it's, it's enjoyable. And also everybody has something different to provide. So it's like, it, it's a great format. Also um, filming and editing has become so democratized now. Like, yeah. man, I uh, used CapCut for the first time <laughs> to like three weeks ago and I was like, wait a second, this is so easy to use yep. and so mm -hmm. unbelievably like complex too. Yeah. Like you can keyframe, you can punch in, you can punch out. You Everyone can, like, knows how to edit. Yeah. And, yeah. and that took me so long to figure yeah. out. <laughs> The fact that you can just do it like sitting on your phone and it's also your camera that you're editing with yeah. is insane. It's insane. It's like yeah. a creative ego type of thing. Cause I've thought about this with myself. Mm -hmm. Like I really want to be known as singular, like a one of one. What I'm totally. doing is unique. And even in our space, as I start to see more shows that interview creators, talk about the behind the scenes, it makes it like less fun. Like I feel like I'm all of a sudden less of myself because there are other people doing yes. it. And that's ridiculous. Yeah, but I get it. Because like, of course there should be a lot more people who are telling more stories. That's good. Mm -hmm. Like I support that. Mm -hmm. But yet creatively, it makes me feel like I am less than I was last year. Well, it feels good to provide something that they can't get anywhere else. Yeah, definitely. Unfortunately, when you invent something or you create something, it will inevitably be copied, For right? Sure. Especially if it's successful. Right. That's the thing. It's like, right. if it's successful, yes. True. But it's like, it's tough. It's tough because as much as, you know, we can be honored that people like admire something that we did, it, it does, it can it can mess with your head and it can and it can uninspire you it also though pushes you to do something new and 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 add something new yeah, it's a good challenge to have to be like so what else do I? but it's 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 almost frustrating where you're like oh i arrived i got to this place where i yeah. have always wanted to come creatively and then yeah. you're like oh why are they why are they catching, why are they here too? Yeah. Like, why are you here too? I, I know. I'm just, like, I created this space <laughs> yeah. myself. Uh, were you, were you like aware of, like, everyone talks about your editing. And like, I remember first watching your stuff and being like, whoa, this is, this is different. This is, you know, like, this is insane. <laughs> yeah, like, zoom in, <laughs> no, zoom was. out. Yeah. Your this head is, was like exploding yeah, at times, it was a like, lot. Yeah. like shaking. I felt and, like, like I was getting punched, but like, kind of in a good way, where I was like, all right, this is like keeping me on my toes. I love but it. Yeah. Were you aware that you were doing something unique? Because the amount of videos on YouTube that are like, learn how to edit like Emma Chamberlain, or like, how many people then did that exact style? Um, were you aware that you were creating a style? Like, what was, what was that era for you? No, like, sorry, I had to burp, okay. Um, so I, uh, actually, I don't think I've ever told the story, maybe I have. Um, in high school, my friends and I used to 
do these like dance routines, like we'd make dance routines. I was a cheerleader, some of my friends were cheerleaders, some of them were dancers, whatever. But we'd make these like funny dance routines. We'd film them on the webcam of my laptop during lunch. And then during my next class, which was history, I would edit them on iMovie, right? And I would edit them like how I eventually edited my videos, which was like zooming in here, zooming in here. And the reason why I did that was because, I mean, this was just simply for my friends and I's enjoy, enjoyment, right? The reason why I zoomed in was so that you could see it better. It wasn't like for emphasis right. or for this yeah. or for that. Right. It was, but then I started to become obsessed. I was like, this is so fun. Like editing these dance routines is what makes it funny. Like zooming into one of my friend's faces, doing this, doing that. And I don't even remember how that happened. It was such an automatic thing. From there, like I didn't do that on YouTube at first. There was like a period of time where I didn't do that. But then when I sort of let go and I was like, I'm just gonna have fun and be me. My dad gave me the advice. He was like, you should treat your YouTube channel how you treated those videos that you used to make with your friends. And I was like, oh, something clicked. And then I was like, I'm just gonna take that editing style over. And the editing for me was very intuitive. It was like, this needs to be emphasized. This doesn't. This, like, there's no formula. It was just like, what's gonna make this funny to me? Mm -hmm. I was a very hyper mm. young person. And that is literally how I saw the world was like zoomed in here, zoomed out here, mm -hmm. like text on the screen. Like it was, that <laughs> yeah. was literally how my brain worked. And people started copying it. And I was like, this is cool. Like, but then it wasn't cool anymore <laughs> when people were like, Emma did not come up with this. Or like, Emma, this is mm. not Emma's editing style. I didn't copy anyone. It was very much me. And so I got pissed. I was like, what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And people were ruthless with me. That was probably the first time I got real hate was people trying to figure out if this was something that I invented or not. And at the end of the day, I was like, I don't care. Who cares? Yeah. But also, like, it was like a, it was like a battle. It was like a battle with the, with the, mm. it, it became like, who came up with it? Whose is it? It got really hairy, kind of. That's interesting. Where's this battle taking place? Like, is this in the it's comments? It's all in the comments. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like, she didn't invent that. And it's like, I didn't invent a lot of things, but, <laughs> but you're copying me. It's okay though. Like it yeah. could all be fine. I copy people too. I copy people's style all the time. I probably copied things in YouTube videos. I copied video concepts. We all copy. It's how we learn and it's how we find our own thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But it became a battle and it was hairy. But also, I was 16. Yeah. yeah. A so, lot of these so other people everything. are 16. <laughs> YouTube is this mix of like high school dynamics and then like yeah. very high level film and creative emotions of, of like we oftentimes as creators aren't treated with the same uh, status or level of respect as like an artist or a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. But like the concept, what you're discussing right now is the concept of auteurship, right? Mm -hmm. Of like, I that's my thing, I made that thing. Yeah. And that's always in question when in filmmaking when there's a lot of people working on one thing. Yep. But like we do as creatives care about that stuff. And I feel like even it's more today to. in 2023, people look at us so much like strategists, uh, media companies, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and sometimes lose sight of the fact that we're just emotional, creative people who like making shit. Yeah. And we care about the fact that we made the thing. We're also, we're so protective because we all have like this, there's so much uncertainty in this industry that we're all scared yeah, at all times. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. oh, is somebody else gonna steal my thing? And then it's over. And then them. they're yeah. gonna go yeah, like this, yeah, and yeah. I'm gonna go like this, and then what now? Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? We're all a little protective of our of our creative ideas. Mm -hmm. Understandably so. Yeah. Because we're like, you know. But you're hard to copy. 
<laughs> I would say Thank today you. you're hard to copy. Yeah, there's but always like, these like hopefully if you're a creator, there's something intangible that's like, yeah, I can yeah. I can copy your zooms, I can copy your this, but you're not gonna be able to replicate like yeah. whatever it is. Well, that's I think what is so like it, it's this industry is magical because it does celebrate people's individuality. You know what I mean? Like the style of mm -hmm. editing, the this, the format, the this, the that. That matters a lot. And, and for some people that who don't show their personality, that's all that matters. But we do have that safety net if we decide to show our personalities that nobody can replace us because everyone on this planet has their own unique perspective. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that makes you irreplaceable if you can, if you can show that. But that's that's a superpower that we all have. You know what I mean? When you say this industry, I'm just curious. I don't even what know what I mean because it's about. so okay. huge. Well, because I look at you and I'm like, you transcended our space, like the the YouTube kind of and social space, into a more just mainstream, right? Like, mm -hmm. to put it lightly, you're in show business. <laughs> I don't know oh, that wow. we're in show business, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I don't. I've always wanted to be in show business. I've always thought I was I don't in show know, business. I don't, I don't know, know when don't know someone will, saying that. will deem me being in show business. But to me, you're in show business. We're not. We're in like internet business. See, I, I don't even know where the hell I am. <laughs> Can I be honest? Where the hell am I? Like right. I, I don't even it, because it's all so like. It's also, the line, it's so abstract. It's yeah. super abstract. It's yeah. like, it, it, and it's blur, it's blurred. It's not, yeah. well, it's yeah. abstract and blurred. It's, it's so, because I'm not, I'm still not in any traditional spaces necessarily. Well, yeah. kind of, like I think some of the stuff you do in fashion is, is yeah, for it, sure. it's most similar to what other celebrities or actors do, right? Mm -hmm. Like working with high fashion brands and being an ambassador or being at Paris Fashion Week, like that's reserved for a certain caliber of celebrity. That's yeah. the reality, right? And yeah. like looking at you do it, then that in turn gives us, I, I think all the, the understanding that you've now transcended <laughs> into a new caliber. Do you feel that way? Yes, but I also think those spaces are changing. Like fashion is no longer like I, I go to fashion shows and there are kids who blew up on TikTok there. Oh, for sure. There's yeah. like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to me, it's so interesting because I feel like it's become one big just culture. Melting pot. Yeah. In a way that there are still some things that I think feel just feel a little different. Like, I mean, I think you know, sort of the environment at like the Met Gala, that feels different. That's just different. I would hope that feels different. It does. I mean, it does in the sense that, like actually everybody hanging out in one room feels the exact same, obviously. It's not like, it's literally the same. It feels like a high, it's, it still feels like a big group of high school. Right. Like kids who kind of know each other, but kind of don't. And maybe that you have a crush on that one. It's like the same, it's literally like prom. That's it. It's yeah. like, you know, and that's how it feels also at maybe a VidCon in a way. It's like. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, well, you haven't been to VidCon yeah, in a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Emma, you haven't been to VidCon in a while. I know, yeah. VidCon. If you can make the connection between the Met Gala and so VidCon, fun. I would love to well, hear yeah. it. <laughs> I just don't know. I'm trying we, over here. We just can't let happen. you make that comparison. Yeah. We've never okay, been to the Met Gala. That's a terrible example. Don't know if we'll be invited. Like, like what? But the like the streamies. Oh my God. I got so roasted for, for my speech at the streamies and it still comes up. Don't tell me you've I, ever seen it. Of course I've seen it. No. Yeah, of course I've seen it. Yeah. I haven't seen it. So yeah. on this I'm, side of the table, you're yeah. I'm squirming because yeah. it's so embarrassing, but nobody told me I was going to win. <laughs> That, they're not supposed to tell you you're gonna win. It's no, the only, show. I thought that this was no, show that's business. Not how it works. See, I wasn't no. in show business. So you weren't now show they tell me before I win. <laughs> now you know. Okay. We've we've delivered streamies we don't even know until yeah. we're up there with yeah. the with the envelope. Whoa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had to practice everyone's name. We had to practice everyone's name. And we really delivered to Charlie D'Amelio. We course. took a big pause. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And we in unison. Oh, I don't yeah. even know how we did it, but it was our moment. And the streamy. 
goes to Charlie D'Amelio. Yeah. That's magic. So yeah, back to the Met Gala and those environments. Like mm -hmm. the one thing I, I just, the videos you've made about the Met Gala, like I've always been enamored by those environments and like, I don't know how I would do in that. Sometimes I end up at stuff like that and mm -hmm. I'm like, I actually don't like this. Yeah. But I like to live in a world where I aspire to do that. Mm -hmm. And what I really liked about um, the most recent Met Gala video you made was we got to come along with you as a friend mm -hmm. and the points of emphasis for me, rather than them being zoom ins or punchy edits, were the moments where there was audio. Yeah. Because there's moments where it's montage, there's music, and it's fun. And and actually those moments are the um, you know, aspirational kind of unattainable moments. Mm -hmm. And then you drop us into hyper attainable, personal, relatable moments yeah. when you're delivering to camera or talking to someone else in the room. Mm -hmm. And that juxtaposition in that video to me was like, Oh, here's someone who gets to do things that are reserved, you know, for for a certain type of person and are unattainable. But she's still bringing us into what's the reality, yeah. which is like you're sitting and eating sushi and ripping out your extensions, yeah. and like, mm -hmm. you know, like there's a reality to what those feel like. Yeah, and it's not all, you know, glitz and glam. There's there's yeah. also just like, yeah, you're still a human being in a hotel room, like yes, and you just sit there until it's time for you to go. Like it's not that. It becomes what it becomes when I'm editing. Like that's really when it gets creative for me. The filming is less creative. It's more just sporadic and on the go and random. And then I build it into something later. And I was so excited when I started to edit that video because I, I that, it, that was such an organic reality mm -hmm. where there was both sides of it. And it was so easy to, create that juxtaposition because it was just handed to me because it's so accurate. Like what it is sort of glamorous. It is it it is, you know, this rare experience. And there is something magical about that. But it changes absolutely nothing else. Like it just doesn't <laughs> right, do anything. Right, right. It literally it's well hold on. Yeah. Okay. The year prior, you have a moment with Jack Harlow. Oh I yep. Where, you know, you have this nice interview. He says, love you as he walks away. You say it back. You look yeah. at the camera. And that moment, to me, took you. Transcended pushed, me. Pushed you yeah. right into the mainstream. Yeah. Do you feel that way? I've never thought about it. Because to be honest, like, I have a really hard time figuring out where, I've, where I sit. Yeah, true. I, I understand. And, yeah, and yeah. I, it's so hard to comprehend that I've gotten to a point now where I'm like, I don't know, and thank God I don't know. Sure. Yeah. It's better not to know, but I definitely did. It was funny, like it's funny when people recognize me from that. Totally, of course. Yes. And I'm like, that's so random. Yeah. Like yeah. that's so random. Um, it there, was great though. Like, there was no a regrets. moment, like a signal for us during that time. Yeah. Jack Harlow was on Fallon and Fallon's talking to him about it. Mm -hmm. And he goes, you had this great moment with Emma, Emma Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. Not like YouTuber Emma Chamberlain, not fashion icon oh, wow. or this or that. It was just Emma Chamberlain. And that to me was a signal mm -hmm. of like, oh, okay. I didn't her even name, think of it like that. Her name is perhaps the only descriptor that yeah. is needed. So she must be somewhat post YouTube, post platform. She yeah. is sort of Accept it into that world. We have a map of where you stand. Yeah, so the world needs a map. You, you don't need a map. Yeah. Me after, I, we've been charting. We just uh, chart God. it every yeah. day. And yeah. We're like, this is where Emma is it's now. Upstairs, we'll show it to you. It's yeah. always evolving. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want. I think right too, now with this, you just shifted a little yeah. bit back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're back on YouTube. Yeah. So you're kind of like, yeah. yeah, you're coming back down. You may be at VidCon next year. I don't know. I, you have to really hit Paris Fashion Week hard next season because things are. Um, I think too, like diversifying where I'm present has really made it now impossible to like, I wonder if too, I've just made it impossible. Like, cause it's like, well, she randomly has a coffee company, although it's not random, but it to, to a random onlooker, it would be random. And then she has a podcast and then she posted on YouTube six months ago, but she has 
quite a few subscribers there. Why yeah. is she not posting there? Is this her job? Like, what's her job? What is her and then job? Then she does red yeah. carpet interviews. Right. Yeah. And there's no descriptor that yeah, can and yeah. encapsulate like, it all. Like, and you show up on a, a Vogue video, or you show up like in these environments that are yeah. I'm like a little bit of everywhere. Yeah. And, yeah. and I love that. Like, I love that because I'm just doing a little bit of everything that. Yeah. I enjoy while, which I think is what I need right now too. It's what I need right now as I'm figuring out what I want to creatively. How much do you look at the, like when we were on the phone, you were explaining that your mind works like an agent and a publicist. So, <laughs> yes. so as like a creative person, how much do you zoom out and look at the Emma Chamberlain brand from a macro perspective and craft it, it, like how aware are you of what you're crafting with the brand itself, not with the individual, you know, you're creative directing a photo shoot or you're making a YouTube video, mm -hmm. like looking at the brand of Emma Chamberlain and strategically going, I'm gonna do that, I'm not gonna do that, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do this because that'll signal that. Like what are you thinking about when it comes to the brand? My number one priority for me is integrity. It, it comes down to integrity. And there are things that, like I do not do something that it doesn't matter. Money does not matter, does not matter. I do not care. I, I which is an absolute, I mean, that's a blessing and, and it's not like, but at this point, you know, when it comes to sort of curating what I'm doing, I can't, I, you have to choose between, uh, I, I would say money and integrity in a way. You can find a balance too. You can actually find a balance. So I take that back. How do I want to put this? As my own, actually, I'm not my own agent. Allie would be like, Emma, what the <laughs> fuck? Yeah, yeah. She's, my own she's, she's like, what the <laughs> heck? <laughs> yeah. Here's but what I, I know did. what you're saying. Like, even because yeah. again, we have the same agent for people who don't know. Yes, we do, have, we do share an agent. She's the best. The best. She's the best. Um, but we also like that is a relationship that you you're collaborative in. Like totally. You know, like it's it's not a one-sided relationship. You are a big part of that relationship. Yes. Of what you say yes to, what you say no to you, what what you even ask her to go find you, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you, she has to understand your psyche so well to, yeah. to bring you opportunities and even to represent you in the market. So yes, I understand. Like, I feel like that on our behalf of like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the agent uh, with Allie. Yes. You know? Like I yeah. think overall for me, I, I try to do things that I'm like, this is cool. Like, that, it's simply that. Yeah. Like, this feels like something I would do for free. That's. You can't ever say that on a phone call, though. You can't oh go. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah. Go, I know. Oh my God, retract I, that. From, I love this. Cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Allie's like, Emma, what are you doing? <laughs> I love this opportunity. <laughs> Do you mind if we just do this one for free? Yeah, literally, yeah. literally. <laughs> you know how I'll say your We heard her on Colin and Samir. Yeah. <laughs> she said if she says yes, like she just wants to do it. It's just yeah. cool. <laughs> literally every deal moving forward. Yeah, yeah. my rate just went down a lot. Um, it, but it should feel obvious. Yeah. Like, oh my God, obviously totally. I want to work with them because I'm a genuine fan or like I've actually, I've discovered I've discovered things through brand deals. Like my favorite sheets right now that I'm wearing. That was a... Mm. Podcast sheets ad that you're read. wearing, did you say? Sheets that are in my bed. That was not what I meant to say. Oh, I was the like, I don't know. I don't know in what my is bed. in on fashion right now. Maybe no. you're wearing sheets. Well, I don't the know. bed sheet is super in this season. <laughs> no, <laughs> got it. Um, my bed sheets right now got sent to me because it, it was like a potential ad read. Uh, they're my favorite sheets I've ever had. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah. we, I'm with you. I understand. You know that. what I'm saying? Like we totally. discover these things, yeah, yeah. but I think ultimately, like at this point, I. I want it to be so organic and so like, like an obvious yes. What does like, cause when you bring up the, when I watch you do um, brand deals now and you work with brands, it's done in such a different fashion than 
you know, what, what we do, which is typically, you know, an integration on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe there's some social content or short form content, but when you do it, it's, it's almost like, um, I don't even know how it's done. It's done in such a different way. You mean like the Canon? Yeah, right Canon there? was super cool. There's um, even like Lancome or like some of the other beauty brands that you work with. It's done more in like a just association way where it's like we are mm -hmm. associated with Emma. Emma is, you know, part of this, you know, this thing we're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like intangible. Um, it's, it is it is a different, It's it's more... Now it's more like almost like campaigns in a yeah. way. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's more like campaign based. I, I feel like there's more creativity in it a lot of times. Like, for example, let's say I have to do an Instagram post for Longcomb. Um, or I don't have to, I get to. I, I, you know, I get to do like a cool photo shoot like vibe, not photo shoot, but like I get to do like, let's say I'm like taking my own content. I now get to have fun, like creating a, yeah, an uh -huh. image that's totally. gonna not only be cool to me where I'm like, this is a cool image. Like I'd pin this on Pinterest or something, but also it also displays the product in a way that's through my lens. Mm. And getting that opportunity is so much more fun for me. Um, you know, YouTube integrations are great too, but they're, they can be tough because it can be hard to add your own sort of personality into it. Do you know Drew Gooden? Yeah, of course. course. The best fucking ad read. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he like, Hilarious. he makes me feel like shit about every brand deal I do because yeah. I'm like, that is. I, that's a real yeah. area where I am very envious. When I watch a creator, we were watching Colt Kerwin do his mm -hmm. OnePlus for a phone and like, he's just so seamless and it's so calm and mm -hmm. relaxed yeah. and, and it fits in the video. Cody and, like, and we, Noel are like that too. Yeah, yeah. Cody and totally. Noel on mm -hmm. TMG, I mean, they just sometimes make fun of the brand, you yes. know? But and you're like, it's, but how, how they get clearance you, on how that? Did you, yeah, I, I was so playing unfair. one for Colin and I was like, how did, did the brand approve this? Or are they just like, you know what you're buying? Like it's us, it's Cody and Noel. And it makes so it good. way more memorable when you hear them do it. Well, and also like now that the fourth wall has been broken and everybody knows, how ad reads work, whether yeah. you're in the space or not. Yeah. It's almost like, like I think people who aren't even, who don't work in our, in our space would hear an ad read like that and be like, that's iconic. Like they right. let yeah. of them say this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the best everyone companies, knows, you know, yeah. Yeah, the best brands are super open to that. Yeah. Because they're like, yeah, just, deliver it. It's I, so much better to be like self-aware because yeah. you're so right. Every audience member knows what a brand deal sounds like. They yeah. know where it is. Like you can't fool them into it of like, yeah, oh, here yeah, you are. Yeah. Like, no, it's just, is what it is. It's I here. think yeah. brands are going to have to shift up the way that they do brand deals soon on YouTube, especially. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think on podcasting, there's something weird and I do my, it because I have on my podcast, I do ad reads. Yeah, of course. I yeah. mean, I though, as a consumer of podcasts, yeah. I don't skip ads. I don't know why. Really? Yeah, I think it's just I like the host and maybe because I'm in this business and I want to hear how the host is delivering it, but the amount of products I've purchased from a podcast ad. Yeah, actually me too. Like I trust yeah. podcasters so much when yeah. it comes to products that I'm, when they deliver it with like honesty, it's just like, yeah, okay, that I'd give that a try. Sure. You, you didn't ad read for adult Legos. And I'm like, yes. I'm, I'm so close. <laughs> I have like, one right now in my garage that I can't wait to start. Yeah. It's like, see, but that's the thing about podcasting too. It's like, and YouTube too. It's such a different way of doing collaborations with brands because it's much more short, short term a lot of times. Yeah, true. Sometimes you'll do like a year long sort of thing where it's like doing four videos for X over the course of the year, and that's more of a campaign sure, sure. sort of style of, of doing things. But it's very different. It's a very different way of working with brands because it's it's short lived. Um, it's it's much more like getting the word out. Yeah, I really like it actually. Also, typically the products are super cool, and you want them, right? So always like. 
Yeah, they're like I consumable yes. or they're like just, they're just nice products. Yes. I think everything's also more comfortable without visuals. If there's not a visual, it's just like, I don't know, visuals sometimes get in the way and I think it's why they get really awkward on YouTube. Because yeah. you have to pair a visual with every mm -hmm. single moment and you're watching this creator who, even if they want to be doing it, they just interrupted, for the most part, their story. Like whatever they were doing, yeah. they interrupted it. That was why I had a really hard time with doing, like as much as, it, it, it was really hard to fit in uh, brand deals into, into my videos at a certain point. Cause I was like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna stop this. It's like if you, it, I didn't wanna stop the flow. Like it yeah, really. Yeah. And, and I, the numbers yeah. get, you know, absurd for, mm -hmm. for someone who starts out and is not making any money and then you get offered large sums of money and you're like, and I know how to do that. Yeah. It's not like a problem you don't know how to solve. It's like someone presents you a problem that you know how to solve for a large sum of money. Mm -hmm. It almost feels ridiculous to say no, especially if you have I any had that, yes. level of fear with the career of that it might end, then you're like, how, how dare I say no? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think it comes down to not like who's going to pay the most, this, this, and that, but rather who can you combine worlds with at a, at a, you know, this is obviously, this is more for, this is not like referring to my podcast, right? Like yeah. the ad reads that yeah, I do yeah, there, yeah. it's much, it's a much different transaction. It's, it's, I like the product. I'm going to do a 60 second read. That's it. Yep. That's it. And I'll talk about why I like it and uh, it'll be whatever, but it's, it's very different. The partnerships with like, with Longcomb or Levi's or, or Ritzy are, you know, it's so different because it's more like, yeah, we're like, it's longer term and we're, we're kind of collaborating in a way. They have to become a character in your universe. Yeah, and that especially with an audience like yours, where the relationship is similar to a friendship. I also like to feel like I can bring something to the table for them. Yeah, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, not only do I love them as they are, but also how can I get involved behind the scenes? Sure. How can I like? How can we do something together? Yeah. How can I bring more than just mm -hmm. an introduction to my audience? Yeah. yeah yes, yeah. but baseline. It needs to be like, this is a brand right. that I think is cool. Yeah. And like, I- How much yeah. has that changed over the years? Like, I'm very curious about your relationship with money. And the reason why is, so I'm a Michael Chamberlain YouTube viewer. Yes. Okay? I watch his YouTube channel. Yes. Your that's your dad. Yes. Um, and I've heard you talk about your dad before, your relationship with your dad. And I think about growing up uh, the kid of an artist and the uh, viewpoint on creative work, and then the incredible complexity to commercializing creative work and yeah. monetizing creative work. And then that paired with a potential uh, feeling of like an absence of money or scarcity of money to then an abundance. Like that is a lot of transformation and a lot of different things going on. Mm -hmm. What was that journey for you like from, you know, growing up with, with your dad being an artist to then monetizing your craft at the scale that you've done it? It has been such a fascinating, I'm glad, I've, I don't know if I've ever, oh, I don't remember. I'm excited to get into this. Growing up, I felt, I grew up around a lot of wealthy kids you know, a lot of kids who have parents that work in technology. I grew up in the Silicon Valley, a lot of money. I'm the child of an artist and in a, you know, single mom. Very different situation. And I always, I was so jealous. I mean, so deeply, deeply jealous. I also saw myself as less very much so because I was not up to speed with the other kids. In retrospect, I had such a fortunate childhood. It's unfortunate that, you know, my environment didn't allow me to see that. 
again, when you're like 12 years old, how can you, I don't, I, I, I can't be mad at myself. How was I supposed to sort that out? It's interesting. The second I started making my own money on YouTube, which was something that I didn't expect, by the way, I turned on AdSense because I was like, obviously, like mm -hmm. maybe I'll make 200 bucks one day over the course of the next six months. I think it's like 200 bucks and then you can cash it out, right? I don't know. I don't That's, remember. I don't we know. we took a really long time to turn on AdSense because we were very inspired by Casey Neistat. And yes. he, we thought it was he, like a brand power He move. didn't have AdSense on for like his first 100 million views. And we we're like, that's cool. We're not going to turn I on I remember AdSense. that too. But his was just like, he didn't, he wasn't, I don't know, he just didn't do it. And yeah. we thought that was so cool. That I we know. Were like, we cool. just took the wrong cue. We're not going to monetize. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we just like struggled. I know, <laughs> like, yeah. I know. See, AdSense is like, I mean, in the beginning before you're, you can make a living off of AdSense before you do brand deals. That's what I did for so long. I didn't take brand deals for a very, very long time. Um, I was very against it at first, actually. And I mean, I started making money on AdSense quicker than I anticipated, you know? It just happened so fast. And it was my first time making money. And very quickly, by age 17, I was able to move out on my own dime. And I suddenly had financial freedom. I could go and buy myself things if I wanted. But I was, I realized very, very quickly that it, did not improve my life. And in fact, the amount of money that my family had growing up was enough to be happy because I had all of the things that I needed. I had everything I needed for school. I had a roof over my head, I had food. I had multiple options in my closet. Like it was like, I had a great everything. I had it already because I, I did research on this later down the line and like, Money only makes you happy to a point. I was already at that point growing up. I had no idea. It typically represents something. Like the desire for money represents something. Mm -hmm. um, and we rarely develop the relationship with the term enough. Mm -hmm. ba basically never, mm -hmm. right? Um, I actually I don't even know if I've told you this, but two weeks ago I stopped at a gas station to get gas and I walked in uh, cause like the thing was broken and I bought three lottery tickets and I've never bought a lottery ticket in my life. No. Why? And I bought three of the like Powerball ones yeah. where like the prize was like a billion dollars. Uh, it was at a billion. It was a billion dollars. It was, and I was just unbelievable. Like, and I it, saw that. It was a night where I was just feeling stressed and like the reality is, and I, I've written about this, I'm a big like journaler, mm -hmm. and I've written about this concept of buying a lottery ticket when you've already won the lottery, right? Like where I have mm -hmm. my dream job, I am have an amazing wife, I have a great family, like I feel so grateful, but I went out and bought a lottery ticket. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, but I get but it. there's a level of escapism to what you connect to this large sum of money. Mm -hmm. And then to, to bring that back to like being a YouTube creator, I think what's interesting is like you have your foot on the gas pedal, mm -hmm. right? Like you can, it's not chance. Every yeah. day you have the option to get more of it. Uh, and I think that is yeah. a, again, that is something that can haunt you if you don't have a relationship. Like how quickly did you recognize that you had enough? It was almost instant, if I'm being honest. It was very fast. Hmm. And. Do you remember the first like AdSense check you got that you were like, oh shit, that's like, do you remember the amount? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, I think, you know, cashing out my first one ever, which was maybe like $200 was crazy. But I think once I hit, I, well, my parents were, be beside, they could not believe their eyes 
when it was 10 grand in a month. I mean, I mean that's crazy. They were like, what yeah. the fuck is going <laughs> on? And I was like, I was like, I don't know. And I say the F word in my videos. Yeah. So yeah. how the hell, I don't, like. Yeah, and I didn't really talk to anyone about it. Yeah. It's just there. It just, they just sent it to me. That was yeah. when they were like, okay, you, something's happening. They you're, were like. You're 17 at the time? Or? Uh, I think 16 at that 16 point. 16 at that point. That's crazy. And it was like, or maybe, maybe that one was at 17. But it was definitely, I mean, again, my dad is an artist. He doesn't need a lot of money. He doesn't care about making a lot of money. Right. He cares about creatively fulfilling himself and also living a good life. Yeah. So having time outside of work to go and live a fulfilling life, right? And we have such a great relationship because he had the time to develop that with me. A lot of my friends, their parents worked so much, that's how they made so much money. They didn't have deep connections with their parents. Mm -hmm. I did. It was very, it, it all happened very fast where I realized, okay, it's not about, like, like money's not gonna do it. Money's not gonna do it. I've already reached a point where I'm, I'm comfortable. I already, like, I'm comfortable enough where it's not going to, I don't know, I don't know. But yeah, I. it was pretty yeah, immediate. Time wealth is a, is a thing that comes, you know, it's interesting because for me, it, it, that concept has come a lot more now after I feel like I've achieved the, the internal validation of making money. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was, a, that was something that was absent from our creative journey for years, yeah. right? It, money was not abundant for us. It was like, if we could make 800 bucks, we would we would do whatever it took to do that, right? Out yeah. of our creativity. Um, but as it's as it started to, you know, become more abundant and even like the the understanding of how to make it, you know, then then you reestablish a relationship. And I think even just going back to buying that lottery ticket, which I didn't win, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. I, oh. I actually I had a feeling yeah. I, wasn't so sure where I, that I didn't was want to going. say that. But, but, the, yeah. the winning ticket was sold in California. Okay. No. In Kern That's County. That's exciting enough. Yeah. That's which was which felt uh unfortunately just like a signal that maybe I should buy another one. I don't know. <laughs> but uh what I realized as weekend. I was thinking about it was I was like, oh, I'm chasing time wealth. You know, like mm -hmm. money wealth is is um is great, but you assume that those two things are connected. Yeah. Right. You assume that like if I make a ton more money, then I'll have a ton more time, mm -hmm. I think. But those are not directly connected. That's that's like a choice that you have to make of what's your value system from okay, if I if I make this money, then what do I want more of it? And maybe our YouTube brains teach us to look at numbers in a way that they should always be going up, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. It's like we are trained with these quantifiable metrics next to our success. There's two of them. We look at numbers on a screen all day. One mm -hmm. is our viewership and subscribership, and the other is our bank account or balance or whatever money is coming in. And those are just numbers on a screen that from the video game mindset of all of this, it's like, I just want, it's more fun when those go up. Well, can I tell you something that's insane? And I actually think that some people are gonna tell me that this is very irresponsible because people could be stealing from me. I have an infrastructure in place in my life with a lot of checks and balances that allows me to never check my bank account. I have no idea how much money I have. I know what I can do and what I can't do, but I have no idea. And I have not looked in years. I have no idea. Wow. That's pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 wild. It's safe. I mean, technically, literally, I could be being stolen from. No, nobody. Yeah. It, no, it's not that. Because there's literally layers and layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of checks and balances. People in my family that yeah. are not, like my mom has right, her right. eyes, but then also my business manager, but then also, like, there's so many people that are, I think we have the same infrastructure. Yes. Right. But I have yeah. like, there's family ties yeah, in there yeah. that I trust too. It's good. like, there's so many layers. 
so that I never have to look because I, number one, because I don't want to make, number one, I don't want to know, I don't need to, I don't need anything beyond what I have now. Like I have a, a house, I have a car, um, I can travel freely. That's enough. I don't need to go buy a yacht and a private jet and a, um, and a helicopter. And I don't need to only own designer clothing. And I don't need, like, I don't, I don't want to know how much because I want to feel like I'm very frugal. Mm -hmm. Like I am very thoughtful about, you know, it, like my house is my splurge. That yeah. is my, mm -hmm. the splurge of my life. Like yeah, that yeah, is, yeah. that's it. But like, I don't know, it can be easy to see like, oh, well this money's just sitting here. Let's put it to work. Yeah, why not but, one helicopter? Yeah. But it's <laughs> yeah, like, I don't one. want the money to give me ideas. Does that make yeah. sense? Like oh, I'd rather that's, like- That's really interesting, yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, I, I'm living as though, Uh, it's such an interesting. It's like a game. It's like a game I'm playing with myself almost. Yeah. But I don't want to see. Like I don't need to know. I'm, I don't know. That's, if that's fascinating. That, that feels Do like you a know response. on like a deal to deal basis though. Mm -hmm. You know what's coming in. Yeah. So you have enough yeah. of a mind to be like, I'm fine. Oh yeah yeah. yeah. Like I can buy coffee every day. I'm fine. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Which is like yes. When I did this exercise uh, of like what, how much do I actually want to make? Because you get into this career and you're like. I just want to make as much money as possible. Of course. Right? And then that's a, just an open-ended kind of goal that's kind of crazy. So I had to write it down. And when I wrote down what I like, what I spend money on every day and was really ambitious with that, mm -hmm. it was so attainable. It yeah. was insane. Like, yeah. I was like, I just want to get a coffee every day without yep. guilt. I want to buy lunch every day without guilt. Mm -hmm. I want to live in a nice neighborhood and be mm -hmm. able to pay rent or a mortgage there. And then I want to be able to travel. Yeah. And I don't even travel that much. So yeah. I was like- this is pretty ambitious uh, and it is super attainable. Yeah. And that exercise I think is just so not done with us uh, that I, I really would push a lot of creators to do that exercise. 100% because I'm fortunate that I've been able to figure out a way where I don't need to have my eyes on this total, right? Like I don't, I know how much, I am very involved in the negotiating of the deal, but after it's it's sealed, it's like, I don't think about it again. We know your tactics. Yeah. Listen, I'll do this for free. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh no. <laughs> we do not yeah. do this yeah, for yeah, free. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, see that's what's so funny about me. Like I don't, I'm not doing things for free, yeah. but also there are things that I, I like do do for free. Like with Chamberlain Coffee, I don't cash out of that. Like I don't take a salary. I refuse, which is very, very lucky, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's like not everything that I do has to make me money, but some things have to make me money. Of course. And that's also your work, like your value as a brand. And, yep. and again, as creators, sometimes you have self worth issues, you know, and like your yeah. imposter syndrome when it comes to that. But that's, that's what you've built, and like that is your business. I think though, like yeah. what you said about not letting money dictate ideas is really, important, really important, no matter yeah. what size of creator you are. And of course there are times where like money is gonna dictate some of the idea mm -hmm. as you're trying to pay your bills. But I do think it's really important, even if you're a smaller creator, like sometimes getting a job is the best way to actually become a professional creator. Totally. Right? To like keep money out of the equation. Out of the creative mm -hmm. equation. Out of, out of the sure. creative equation yeah. because that is actually everything. Like when you started, yes. money was not in the equation and you were able to create something very unique that people couldn't get anywhere else. And that's where money came in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And you want to stay in that pocket just for your self-worth of trying to give people something they can't get anywhere else. Yeah. And that's not going to be dictated by money. Like I, there's a few sort of things that have come up over the years where the money has been unusually, whoa, like that's a lot. Yeah. And, but, but it was so, 
it's so not me. It's just not me. And, and you know, there's always a little like, ah, like, that's a lot. Like, but, <laughs> but then, but I've gotten to a point now where, and again, this is a very fortunate place to be in, but where I'm like, you could raise that to, you could triple it and I can't do it. I just can't. Because I think the reason why I've been able to get to that point is because I know how it feels to stand firm and to only do deals that are right for me and my brand. That is such a fulfilling feeling to me. And it's the only way to make brand deals feel fulfilling for me. Um, it's also the best path to like a long career. Well, that too. Cause there, there definitely are two ways. Like, I, you know, I, I don't judge those who are like, I'm going to cash out and get out. <laughs> yeah. See, that was never an option for me though. I never was like cash out, get out, which is funny because I feel like I have the personality to cash out and get out because I wouldn't mind living a private life again at some point. So it's like, like that's not like my worst but nightmare. That ship has sailed for the time being, right? I don't want to cash out. And I like, I feel in, uh, excited about staying in this general world. For sure. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I guess we could call it entertainment, but it's showbiz. showbiz. It's showbiz. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. showbiz, baby. I don't think I can ever. Oh man, I'm. I am. Listen, things may change. Where I'm at may change, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm still trying to figure out. I am. I'm in showbiz. Like, I can't get out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're in it. You're trapped. And it's also you're caught by the way. I'm trapped in showbiz for a creative person. It's fun. Like. Your canvas just changes. Yes. And that's okay. That's exactly it. Right? Like your canvas, I feel like for me watching you and, a, and as a fan of yours, like I've watched your canvas change to, you know, fashion and photography and, um, you know, even the way that you portray Chamberlain coffee is very different than what it used to be. Yeah. Right? And the, the, I, I looked at one of your photo shoots you did and there's like this shot of you with all the cups around you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's cool. I'm really into photography. I would love a canvas to express my vision when it comes to photos. Totally. And I used to do that with my dad's clothing company and yeah. get involved in the photo shoots there. But I was like, oh, that's cool. I I can't wait for us to drop another, you know, capsule of merchandise because I'd like to yes. do mm -hmm. some photography stuff. Totally. And I think that is the thing of like the exciting part of getting to do all this is you get to shift these canvases. And mm -hmm. I don't doubt that we'll see something, if you want to, see something directed by you, like a film yeah. at some point or written by Emma Chamberlain. Like I think that is just a shift in canvas. And Absolutely. Would you ever act? I have always, 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 always said no. And been like, well, not said no, maybe. Did I say no? I don't like, know. wait, shit, I'm it in a movie. It sucks when you say yeah. everything publicly because then you, if you recall wrong, you're like, well, she's a liar. Um, I always have thought no. But weirdly, as I'm growing up, I'm realizing that it's something that could be creatively fulfilling for me in the sense that I am obsessed with analyzing people. It's all I think about. It's all I do. Like it is, I mean, it's a lot of, I do a lot of it on my podcast. Like I'm analyzing people and personalities and I mean, I call my parents once a day and analyze someone. Like I'm always analyzing someone like, well, they're really interesting. Because, are you scared now? I, I know just you like be. which one of us is going to get to be analyzed. You know, that's. Well, uh, you just, do you want to be analyzed? No, I'm you just, both as a duo. It could be okay. us as a duo. Yeah. The dynamic duo. Yeah. But then it's like, in a week or two. It, it could be one of us. Yeah, you, who knows? That's, okay. that's now it's all I'm thinking about is which one of us is going to be on. The it'll only call. be good things. It'll be like, <laughs> how are they so stable? <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> um, but I'm open to the idea now. 
only because I actually really do think it would be like cathartic to not be myself. Oh, oh interesting. Like yeah. I think it would be like really fun mm -hmm. to yeah. be someone Are, else. Have you done acting or, cause I, I, I'm in improv class right now. Yes. Improv 201. Uh, and I just did my first class uh, of the session on Sunday night and I kind of can't believe that I'm willing to go there. I don't in blame some of yeah. these. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I was so expressive as other characters and I was recognizing that I, I, I struggle alone with a camera. Yeah. I really do. And I, I like, that's a lot of why this format came to be. Cause it was like, I can be myself when I'm looking at someone. Mm -hmm. I can be myself when I'm not so aware that there's a camera. Yeah. But when I'm looking down the lens of a camera, I'm, I, it's hard for me. And, um, when I'm in these, this class, it lets me explore the, the bounds of what else I have from an expression. Yes. Point of view. yes. And I'm just, have you, have you tried it? Like I've done, it's so interesting. Like I've done, I just did a, um, like sort of a commercial for Warby Parker. I don't think it's out. It will be out. That's cool. Um, cool. Well, because I did a you, collection with them. I designed a glasses. Oh, you did? I'm wearing them. Oh, wow. Um, this is one pair. Wait, do you, was, they had a frame called the Chamberlain. I know, and that's a total coincidence. Oh, that was just total coincidence. Oh, wow. Total coincidence. Wow, that's dope. That's a cool partnership. So did you yeah. act in the commercial? So basically, yeah, I, I like vaguely acted in this commercial. And. Wait, you're wearing the. Warby. These are from the collection. I am a, I'm wearing contacts right now. I'm a glasses wearer. I have you need multiple the Warby, Warby collection. I'll I, send you all I of them. I need the Emma Chamberlain Warby collection. Obviously. Yeah. Wait, great. that's amazing. They look great. They're yeah. my favorite. I mean, they, I've been wearing Warby Parker. Colin also I has a glasses. lot of glasses at home. Yeah, because. He doesn't need them, but he I just I want to be yeah. a glass person. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> can I be honest? These are not, I do need readers, but these are not even, these are this just about. This is all I needed. This is what he wants. Because I've just been having this dilemma of yeah. like, can I really wear glasses? Yes. And I've been buying all of these <laughs> reading glasses and blue light glasses. See, say, just be like, it's for blue light. I'm protecting can, my okay. circadian rhythm. You just gave you know me funny, permission. Though? I'd like yeah. to speak Thank to you. all of my, you know, contact and glasses wear, people with bad eyes. Because I've had glasses since I was three years old. I have always dreamed of what it's like to wake up in the morning and just see. Look, the grass like, is always that, greener. Yeah. You know? No, but I'm yeah. I've always dreamed. Like, what would it be like, like, like if I could wake up and have an excuse? <laughs> and, to wear and glasses. you just couldn't see anything? Yeah. yeah. It's just it's insane that we just like what a crazy thing I that know. as human beings, there's some of us that just can't see. I know. Without like and then who came up with this is a total tangent, but who came up with this stuff? Like how did they what's find in my eyes right now? Yeah. And how did they come up with Contacts this? Contacts are crazy. They're crazy. They are crazy. crazy. It's like really, honestly, talk about life changing tech. Totally. That's yeah. really yeah. some, of, <laughs> yeah. some yeah. of our best work. I don't think we marvel contacts. enough about contacts. Because what know, if like someone didn't AI come things up come with out that. left and right, but like, contacts what, are contacts? <laughs> yeah. like contacts. Yeah. what if Yeah. What if someone just didn't, whatever they decided that that innovation wasn't necessary? Oh my God. What would I do? I think about that sometimes. Like, you what would wear Chamberlain. No, glasses. but what if there was yeah, no obviously. glasses? Like, no, no one figured out that if you just like, do this thing to glass that we can now see. Like, what if no one figured that out? It's really, it's frightening. Yeah. Well, thank God for the Warby yeah, Parker Chamberlain clock is now, yeah. And now everything's making sense. No, now I can see clearly. They now, yeah, and you can too. <laughs> yeah. Out on November something. Don't remember. I forgot. This um, whole thing is just an ad. It's just for, an ad. Yeah. So it, this is how I do my brand deals now. A whole interviews to lead Through to other the, people's YouTube channels. To to yeah. So now, okay. So anyway, barbieparker.com. Um, where were we? We were talking we were about, talking about acting. Deal. Oh, oh, acting. You were acting. Yeah, you were so I acting. acted in this commercial. It was so fun. Like even though it was like literally like a sixty second commercial. It was fun, and I liked being like a, a little bit of a character. And I mean, listen, I would never want to get hired for a job because I already have a career elsewhere. And, and like, there's, you know, oh, she has Instagram followers. Like, maybe I would never, I would refuse right. to take a job just because of. That. I don't want to yeah. be an actor to a point where I would do it just to do it. Like I would want to make sure that I'm genuinely right yeah. for this role and there's no other 
variable. You don't want to feel like the integration in the movie. Yes, no. Like, I would want to genuinely act and, like, blend in and nobody would notice. Like, that's the only way I would ever do it. And we'll see. It might never happen. It might happen. I I mean, I, I do have a craving to be more behind the scenes in, in yeah. you know? But I think you need, like, because I have that craving too, but I think you need, or what I want is the mm-hmm. empathy for all the different roles. And Agreed. I think it's because, again, the mind of a YouTube creator is like, you're making the programming decision, you're coming up with the idea, you're editing, you're in it, mm-hmm. you're the talent. So when we talk to each other, we can understand every step of it, even the mm-hmm. thumbnail creation. And at, like every step of it, yeah. we understand the pain points. And if I was involved in a movie, I, I don't think I could comfortably be involved unless I understood the honest pain points of every piece of it. Yep. And that's like, I don't know how you do that, but it, maybe it's just from sitting with the people, but yeah. acting or being on camera is one of the things that I think I would have to get intimately involved in. Yeah, I, it's it, it's true. It's like the best, I, I mean, I think a lot of really great directors, are they were actors. Yeah, for sure. Because they can it's have empathy. the only way you can, yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. Did you do theater at all in high school? No. No. I didn't either. You didn't either, right? No, but that is a whole, I did theater up until I changed uh, schools. Okay. And then when I was at this school, I was just like, I need a new thing. And I was very into theater. Like my brother and I both had agents when we were kids. We were in a- So LA. It was super LA. LA. I mean, like that's so LA. Yeah, yeah. we we had- So LA. Well, okay, we didn't both have agents. My brother had an agent and I piggybacked. You're like born with an agent And I piggybacked. Totally. We have our headshots as kids in my parents' house, which I can put on screen right now. Please. Um, We were in like a Hanes commercial, which was like a big thing. My brother was like auditioning for this Disney thing. And then we had a falling out with his agent and my, like, it was like- it was super LA. Well, it was yeah. full show was it like it was, was it like all over baby. the trades? Like were they no, talking but about? we were all over the trades for another thing. <laughs> this is another tangent. But my brother and I were in a uh, Bollywood slash karate dance duo, and we would perform all through LA. Uh, and we got ripped apart by a news publication at one point, no. saying that like we were overhyped. Yeah, it yeah. was a whole overhyped. And, and, yeah, yeah, and that's why you do what you and do. And that's why I do what today. I do. Now. That's why yeah. you're here because now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you show yeah. that trade. Yes. Yeah, but like, that I've was like never the, heard of that type of performance. So you were definitely we were not going to one of its kind. We were, you were one of one. We were one of one. Way ahead of its time. We were one of one. Um, they just didn't understand you. So, yes, I was like, I, if I could go back, I would have gone all in on theater. But like my understanding of, again, it comes back to what we talked about in the beginning. Your relationship to how the opposite sex or whoever you desire mm-hmm. desires you mm-hmm. like that relationship informs everything. I felt everything. like I had to play sports. Yeah. Me like too. I looked at the like kids oh. who were in theater. I was so envious. Yeah. And it looked cool, but I couldn't do it. I know. Even though I was like five, five and a hundred pounds. I was like, <laughs> no, like I am an athlete yeah. and you will see me as I an gotta, athlete. I got to lift weights. I got to kind of be, like, be macho yeah. and like yeah. theater is awesome. And I love theater, but can't I just have it. to leave it behind now. Yeah. I remember when I did I did improv last year for the first time and I also couldn't believe I was like these characters what's coming out of me is absurd and it's yeah. so yeah. fun and it's so freeing Yes. and I couldn't believe that I had never done it in high school. I know. Well, honestly the thing about act, like this is there was so long when I rejected the idea of me being an actor and the reason for that was I'm a YouTuber first and there's a lot of stigma big time around the transition. And I understand that because I think a lot of this, uh, I'm having an epiphany, this is great. I think a lot of YouTubers try to transition into traditional forms of entertainment because they don't feel like they've made it yet. Mm That's what it is. It's like, yeah. I haven't made it yet. My career is not set in stone. I need to go and, you know, I need to go and make music. I need to go and, you know, I need to go do those things or else I haven't made it yet. I don't have that. Like, I don't have that. I don't care about that. If I were to ever go and act, it would be to fulfill a creative desire. Like, oh, it would be so fun to fully embody this character and I feel like it's something I can do well and it's to add to a film that I believe in, that's it. Like, 
and I think that that's the only way that you can do it where it makes you feel. I think that that's the only way that it can work. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but like, the, it's all just whatever. Well, because like, it's, it's, it's all just whatever. It's all just whatever. And we just live in this am, like ambiguous world of what is making it mean. What is it? What does any of it mean? Well, what are the, the bounds? What are the bounds like, of what you can and if can't you do, do? It and you like it enough to keep doing it. The narrative around it, it's like whatever. It, you know. True. I mean, I think. Oh, but you would get judged hard. Oh yeah, yeah no matter yeah. what. Oh, <laughs> if you did it, so 100%. hard. Oh my god. But there's a point be, where you do it yeah. long enough if yeah. you like it enough, where people are like, okay, yeah, she's an act, like she's an actor, whatever. Yeah, whatever. I. The only way I'd ever do it is that, I, like, I would have to be genuinely really good at it. See, but it's hard to like just test it out. Like, I mean, yeah, you can take classes and stuff, but like being on set and like how you're totally, edited, it's yeah. all out of your control. Yeah. But I've come to terms with the fact that I need to do what will creatively fulfill me. And I cannot care about what anyone's saying around me about it. And what I've noticed is when I, when I do that and I honor that, it usually ends up going better than I would expect. Right. It's when you make a choice based on the status that it'll bring you, the money that it'll bring you. Weirdly, the audience feels that. They can feel that. Like if I were to go and be in a movie because that, that wasn't even a good fit and I maybe even like gaslit the director and the casting director <laughs> to be like, well, but I have Instagram followers so you should put me in. And then they put me in and it's like not a good fit and everything's forced and everything's like, it's clearly me trying to force something else to happen. The audience feels that and we'll shit on it. Is that to say that they won't shit on something that's genuine and like a real passion? <laughs> yeah. Of course they will, but do you agree with that? Like I feel like yeah. when a lot of times they can feel it. I think you also are searching for, like that was shit, right? I'm just saying like when you do always. something that's not aligned always, with always. you. You're kind of like, okay, show it to me. Show mm -hmm. it to me. You open YouTube Studio or like Instagram mm -hmm. and you're like, yeah, where is it? Where is it? I thought and I was. you just fly <laughs> yep. right past the like, this was awesome. And you're like, there it is. Yep. There it is. I knew it. They knew it. She sold out. Yep. 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 I did. <laughs> I did sell out. And I did. And I did. Yeah. And you like, you're searching yeah. for that validation of what you know. Cause like you said it. Like it's very, it can, for anyone who's watching the show to be like, okay, so like, how do I do what Emma did? Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, it was my intuition. That's the truth. You just kind it of, is. and you kind of like, just let that guide you. And then at the same time, I think you have to develop a relationship with whatever the craft is that you enjoy the process of doing the craft, not the outcome that comes from the craft. Mm -hmm. Right. And, mm -hmm. and if you're in that like enjoyment of the practice or the craft, then some of those outcomes, those ups and downs you can deal with. And you're totally. very aware of when the practice is like uncomfortable and they're like, ah, oh, that's not it. That's you just made such crap. a great point that resonated with me. You have to enjoy the practice of doing it. Yeah. And that got really hard for me with YouTube because everything about it was so isolating for me. My specific, uh, the way that I did things was very isolating. I filmed everything mainly by myself. I would have loved to make more things with my friends, but it gets a little bit complicated to be including friends in videos when it becomes really public. Not everybody wants a public life like that. Not everybody wants to be in a video, right? Or the inverse. Some, someone but also really wants yeah. to be yeah, in a video. Yeah, and that's also a bad sign. And that's a bad sign. All yeah. the people and that you want in your video, unfortunately, <laughs> they're the ones that don't want to be in your video. Right. But that's why they're good to have in your video. <laughs> right. So it's like, good luck. Even if that person is neutral about yeah. it, the audience will develop a, a relationship totally. with yeah, that yeah, person yeah, and yeah. want them in the and video. And then you stop being friends with them, and then it's like, okay, well, what now? Uh, the, you know, They get harassed for months. Like, why aren't you in Emma's videos anymore? And it's like, that's not fair to them. So I've, you know, started to protect people more and not include them in things as much. Um, 
you know, editing the videos too. Like, I mean, I had a phase where I had an editor, but for the majority of my career thus far, I've been editing my videos. And I went back to it again for that like more emo phase where I started editing my own again. Anyway, um, but like, I don't enjoy working alone anymore. I like working with people. I do think my podcast works because it's much more inside. Like my like comfy Emma time is writing my outlines now for my podcast. That works. I'm alone anyway, a lot, so it, it works. But it's like, I don't like being on camera alone anymore as much. What about for the pod? Because you are, I, th yeah. the one thing I really thought about when it came to your podcast was the addition of video and how much the addition of video changes the creative process and the creative practice of podcasting. It absolutely does. We've done it. Yep. Look at us. You know, yep. We used to do this just as an audio show. It was a very different show. That's a or different show. It felt very show. different without video. I do think from a completely creative perspective, I record a better episode when there's no video. Yeah, for sure. Same, yeah. yeah. It's the lights. I've started to wear sunglasses when I record mm -hmm. because it mimics the feeling because it's dark. Mm. I can't explain it. Yeah. But it mimics the feeling of recording with no video. Interesting. Um, but I like video because like, I love watching video podcasts. Mm -hmm. I feel Same. more I, connected yeah. to it. So I completely understand it. And so that's why I do it. You know, it's like, I, I get, part of me is like, God, why did the industry make that shift? Or now every podcast it's a weird, I, I actually uh, think, I, I really think the long term it, it'll probably shift back. To, well, because I think the content's ultimately better. It's better, yeah. and and the relation, the stickiness with the audience when they're, you're just in their ear, and obviously there's people who listen to the mm -hmm. show, and we don't put the video on Spotify or Apple mm -hmm. Pods, mm -hmm. uh, not yet, but we mm -hmm. don't, and a bit of it is intentional to be like, if you're an audio listener, you're just an audio listener, totally. and that's okay, and like the relationship I have with people I listen to mm -hmm. and just listen to is way deeper. So mm -hmm. deeper. Because you have to like, you're envisioning them of like how they're speaking and how they're interacting. And I yeah. don't even sit quietly and talk to my best friend or my mom for that long yeah. and just listen to them in my ear. So my relationship with podcasters is way deeper than almost anyone totally. in my life. I think they're also just giving you a better, more vulnerable, more open, more real mm -hmm. version of themselves. Yeah. I almost only consume, like for my entertainment, I mainly consume podcasts. Cause my, I may, I usually consume my entertainment like throughout the day, like Same. in between, Agreed. you mm -hmm. know? And I can't sit, like it's so much effort to like sit and watch something, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. not effort, but it, it uses way more senses. Like you, I, you can't do it while, like you can do it while you're doing other things. But yeah, I listen to a podcast if I'm like doing the dishes, folding yeah. laundry, cleaning up, mm -hmm. and it's very enjoyable for me. I, I also really fall asleep to them a lot too. Hmm. Who are you falling asleep to? Yeah. Huberman Lab. Okay, Andrew Huberman. He, God, he came out of nowhere. He, you know, I know he didn't, but he did. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but it, but I love him for falling asleep because. He's so, his voice is so gentle. I take and, whatever he says as gospel. Me he, too. The other day, yeah. I don't we're know getting if you, up at yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the second this yeah. ends out, we're it's, out. It's, we're I'm like staring into the sun. <laughs> I've been doing that. It's also such a flex that in the beginning of his episodes, he's like, look, this has nothing to do with my work yeah. as a professor yeah. 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 at Stanford. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, okay. Yeah. Right, like, he said this thing about like the oh, ideal. Oh, at Stanford? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, okay. Like it has nothing to do with what I do outside yeah. of this as a professor. <laughs> At Stanford. Yeah. You know, like, this uh, thing he uh, said, man, like, I'll believe anything you said. Anything. Is this thing he said about, um, like, the ideal, like, human week when it comes to movement and exercise? <gasps> I need to listen to that And one. one of them was, like, you need to do hardcore sprints once a week. Really? And that was me re-establishing a relationship with Barry's oh. boot camp <laughs> and deciding that- You already that, know that yeah, I have a I relationship yeah, with yes, Barry's. with Barry. Yeah, uh, with Barry. Yeah, but I sprint so hard me in too. that class because I think of what he said and I'm like, 
he was like, we're like animals and we need to be able to sprint. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> Andrew, I'm in. Dr. Huberman, I'm in. I'm into that, whatever that is. I'm um, like overwhelmed with things you have to do right now. Like sprinting, things like that. Like I feel like, <laughs> like <laughs> things like that. Like the fact that like, okay, now I need to yeah. like, I need to sprint. You need to be sprinting. I would like you do pay need for, to be sprinting. You do need to be exactly. sprinting. I'm not yeah. sprinting. Yeah. Like I need a version of berries that's not just like the sprinting and the weightlifting. Give me everything. It's called yeah, double yeah. floor, let's my just make, it an hour, checklist make it an one hour class. longer <laughs> and yes. just like, let's hit the checklist. Let's stare do it at, all. We all go outside, like, stare into the sun, put, put our feet, my feet in the grass. In the grass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, just all give the, me it all because yeah. I can't keep track. No, me either. It's a lot. Um, why did you delete TikTok? Oh. Or delete your TikTok? OMG. Because during the pandemic, I found your TikTok to be very comforting. I don't know. It was just... I was, it was a very weird era of time. It was it's like, so weird. It was so strange when it first started. So weird. And I remember watching your TikTok to, and, and it, it it just like made me feel normal. Uh, I'm so glad to hear that. And but I'm not sure. But it had to be deleted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk to that me about like so your, sweet. your relationship with short form vertical content because you don't really make any of it now. And it is I know. The, the, the format of the moment. Um, totally. Across platforms, right? I'm not opposed to short form content. I mean, it's not like something that I'm super stoked about because I think I'm just able to be more creative personally with long form. I mean, I think Vine was a good example of short form content being an incredible test of creativity for some. A lot of people really blossomed in that environment. TikTok's the same way. I became dangerously addicted to TikTok where like I'm at the gym. I'm like literally like, lifting a weight with one arm, like scrolling with the other, I'm walking on the treadmill, I'm scrolling. I realized that it was infecting my brain with not only too much information, but also like a lot of bad information. Information meaning not like about the news, but just information. Like somebody saying, well, I just spent this much money on this thing and I don't regret it. And then the next thing being like, ladies, you want that man to love you? Listen up. Kidnap his mom. Okay, let's stay with me. I know it's crazy, but stay with me. Like that vibe. It's like, and then the next one's like, play hard to get. Here's how. The next one's like, this is the new diet that you should be on. It's like everything is like information that I do not need. It was all toxic, all toxic. Telling me how to live my life, uh, telling me what to buy, telling me what to think. It was, it was taking over my brain. And what I realized was, not only is this destroying my mental health as a user, but also I have nothing to add on this platform. I have nothing meaningful to add here. And it was around the time that I started to really prioritize providing some sort of value. Like I wanted there to be yeah. a bit more meaning. I'm not trying to be, I'm not Superman. I was getting hated on on there too. Like it felt like there was always some sort of like TikTok about me. That wasn't even mm. necessarily negative always, but sometimes negative, but there was just a lot of chatter and it was all on my For You page about me. I could not handle it. It drove yeah. me insane. Yeah. It drove me it's fucking insane. It's a strange experience. Yeah. But you also I think the algorithm was like, oh, this this is something that this person cares oh, about. Yeah. It's this yeah. person. It's like she yeah. stayed on it for like a yeah. second longer. Yeah. Like, Give her one and more. So I got started to get too much and I was like, this is just like, it was compound. But it's also just, I don't think it's healthy. Like I don't think it's healthy. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. think that there's a way to use it in a way that's healthy. I don't think there is. And oh, this is a terrible, you're gonna get no ad sense actually if I make this comparison. But it's like the difference between like having like a little glass of wine, YouTube, and a line of Coke, TikTok. Sure. It's like, <laughs> wow, that's different. Yeah. Not that I've done Coke, cause I haven't, but it's, wow, that's different. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's really, and there's no way to do TikTok in a way that's healthy. Reading like a book is like drinking a cup of tea. Exactly. In that, in I that just world. started looking. In our yeah. new I started world thinking about the made? new substance spectrum of yes. content, and yes. that's I don't even know what you said next. I was just there, so 
podcasting? What were you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> I don't remember either. Now I'm there because yeah. I'm like, well, podcasting to me, that's like, that's actually very coffee to me because it's like mm-hmm. a little caffeine, but it's yeah, like it gets still you, like. It gets you inspired, gets yeah. you going. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's it's good. matcha, honestly. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. But matcha, like, depending on the you. podcast, though. I, by the way, drank all of your, or I mean, it's powder form, so I had to mix it with water. All of your Chamberlain matcha, the one with like the cute dinosaurs you. on it. Yeah. We had like the chocolate one and the like, but the, the, for me, I'm like a green matcha purist. I, so. I get it. I'm, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I get it. Very good. Thank you. Where does entrepreneurship sit with you in your world of being Emma Chamberlain? Like, and specifically as it pertains to Chamberlain coffee. Because again, yeah. when that started, I remember being like, we we came up with like terminology around when you launched that. Mm-hmm. One was um uh what was it? Content product fit, which essentially meant mm-hmm. that you do not need to change the content to integrate the product. Yes. And creators who do that. That's yeah. my like whole strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just yeah. put a word to it. Done. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that I mean that's what we were we recognized that like we were like, wait. She was drinking this coffee before and then now there's the, this one. and the content didn't change and now it's hers. And yeah. that was the beauty. That was like incredibly beautiful. Uh, you know, what, when to it came guys to like us, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank to guys you so were much. That was a beautiful yeah. moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you know, today you you don't really have like the same opportunity to integrate it as much. Um, yeah. But, but you are now like a you know you're a coffee entrepreneur, and you. I will say that I. Dro- we drove by in Erwan when you yeah. were doing lattes. Oh my god! We're like, oh, we'll go. We'll go meet Emma and go check it out. It was around the block like <sighs> four times, and we we're like, nope, oh, okay, I'm not, not gonna do that. We're gonna go. Yeah, we're just, <laughs> not even going nope, in for the hot even, bar. We're yeah, just out of here. We're yeah. just out of here. Yeah. <laughs> but like, what is your relationship to to being an entrepreneur and being a, a and to Chamberlain Coffee, the business? It it doesn't feel like a brand deal in the sense where that you know like a brand's coming in and they have money and resources and uh, in a already established sort of situation. And now I'm working with this brand and if it works out and, it, and it's a successful collaboration, great. But if not, it's totally fine. They'll go on their merry way. I'll go on my merry way. They existed before. They'll exist after. I existed before. I'll exist mm-hmm. after. Mm-hmm. It's a very, it's like, I don't feel like, like all of the work that I do for it is behind the scenes. I'm fully in it. This is not like my name is slapped on it Mm -hmm. at all. And that would be a lot easier, but it's not (laughs) that way. I'm trying, I don't want, Chamberlain Coffee to me is not like a merch line. And that's sort of been like a, you know, like a, a lot of people have been like, well, is this just sort of like, this is just Emma's merch. And that doesn't really happen as much anymore, but that was sort of something that was said in the beginning and understandably so. It's like, why is this kid coming out with coffee? And, and how the, and is she just doing this to capitalize on the fact that people know her as a coffee drinker? That's where the idea started, but it very qu- quickly became like, I love building a business. Like I love it. Like I love being involved. I love the conversations with retailers. Like I love these like big board meetings where we're like discussing like this strategy and this strategy. And we're like talking about why we should discontinue this product and not this product and what, how we can improve this product. Like I enjoy that piece of it the most. Mm-hmm. Like I've like developed a passion for that through doing this. Um, and it's very much a part of my day-to-day life. Like it's, it, le- it probably takes up 40% of my working time. And yeah, then I'd say cool. podcast is like another 40. And then I'd say 20 is like photo shoots and you know. Does that, what you just broke down, the 40, 40, 20, does that reflect how you make your money? No. no. How, how does that that pie chart differ from that? <laughs> well, Chamberlain Coffee, I'm, yeah, yeah, I've you're, only you're, ever invested in right. it. Um, 
So actually, that's negative. <laughs> so right. we got a nice 40%. Yeah. In the negative. But right. I mean, obviously, you know. You're building a business. That, that, exactly. that follows different it, rules. Totally. Yeah, that follows different rules. It's, yeah. it's different because it's like, this is, not only is this just like genuinely something that I'm passionate about building, but it's also, yeah, it, it is like a passion project almost. Yeah. And eventually, you know, who knows? There are ways that I'm going to be able to make money from it at some point. Um, and I don't know if that's going to, be a lot, it might not. It, it quite literally might not. By the way, it could all go under tomorrow. We don't know. Like it's, running a business is, nobody, it's pretty cutthroat out there. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, Especially when you're fighting for shelf space. Uh, oh it, yeah. Because you're in retail now. Like yeah. you are in mm -hmm. stores. And we talked to- Cut throw. We, we talked to Jimmy about this. Yeah. Too. Oh yeah. <laughs> it was like yeah. open space. And yes. those people aren't like, oh, welcome, Emma Chamberlain. Yeah. Come on, they take, don't some give of a our, fuck. take some of our shelf space. Like that is, and now you're in a business where like it is, you are taking someone's customer. Yeah. So that is like a, a different game. And we, we talked to Jimmy about this quite a bit with Feastables mm -hmm. and the chocolate business, uh, or you look at what Logan is doing with Prime and like the the hydration business. Like those are you guys are in cutthroat businesses yeah. that have legacy, you know, uh, brands and old money and like people who do not want their throne taken from them. Yep. The fact that like a homegrown internet kid can can it's do insane. that is is like very empowering. And so I think empowering. The, these three brands are the brands that everyone talks about mm -hmm. when it comes to creator products, mm -hmm. Chamberlain Coffee, Feastables, and Prime, yeah. right? Like those are, we are we talk about those, the industry talks about those, those are like the three. Chamberlain Coffee is definitely more indie and I love it. But when you raise money for it, it yeah. does introduce a new, somewhat of a new expectation for the people who invest Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, not somewhat, it introduces a new expectation. And that comes back to what we talked about of money being a creative partner in what you make. Yes, absolutely. You, you have to, as the creative, distance yourself and surround yourself with the right operators mm -hmm. that you can be the creative. You can paint it as a cool creative vision mm -hmm. and then let the other people decide or figure out how it lives up to what it's supposed to from a, a capital perspective of how much money you raised. I would say like half the team is very creative minded and half the team is very like, mm -hmm. This is a fucking business. Yeah, we're gonna yeah, make yeah. some fucking money if we can. Yeah. And we're gonna do this right and like, but we're also gonna do this big. Like, let's do this as big as we can. So it's it's those two mindsets. My goal is to make Chamberlain Coffee like a real brand that people like without me in the picture. Yeah. That's the goal. Of course. I, I don't want I I mean, I have an absolutely incredible head start because of my circumstances. And I am not, like that is huge. That's the only reason why this was possible. But I, I do want it to have a life outside of me. Now, what's gut-wrenching about that is that it might not. Like that's my goal. Yeah. But right. it might not. It might not. And, and that's the thing with anything entrepreneurial. It is fucking cutthroat. I, nobody gives a fuck, no one cares about your feelings in that world. And there are so many people who wanna do exactly what you're doing and there's almost no room to fuck up. There's no room, like it's like you get one shot at everything, it feels like. And again, I might have a little bit more flexibility because there's a voice to speak to like, mm -hmm. but, I will be honest, like it is the root of a lot of my stress. I mean, it's it's expensive to do it. It's exhausting. It is, it's nothing that I expected it to be. I wouldn't take it back. But also basically what I'm telling you is don't start a business. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just more, like it's so, there's like an infatuation with the idea of any idea, whether it's a video or, um, you know, a startup, mm -hmm. there's an infatuation and a romance with the idea when it first arrives, right? Yes. And there is. And then 
you paint this vision of what your life could be together, similar to when you meet someone you're romantically interested in. Absolutely. The second you, you at least this is me, as like a hopeless romantic growing up, I would meet someone, I'd be like, amazing. This is what our kids are going to be like. And this is the ch family trips we're oh, going to take together. Oh, I've almost gotten married three times. Yeah, you know what I'm sure. saying? I'm I, 22. Yeah, like, it's yeah, not yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I go there with my ideas too, mm -hmm. right? I have an idea for a business and like, the amount of domain names I own because I've, it's <laughs> a, a problem. problem. I get sometimes it. I get it. Go Daddy, like a diamond platinum yeah, member. Sometimes GoDaddy go calls Daddy. me and just thanks me for my business because I also can't let them go. So right, I just renew you're like, them. One day I might. I got a renewal bill that was just out of this world. And I looked at it and I was like, Oh my God, those ideas are just. To be addicted to domain names <laughs> is so <laughs> well, niche. <laughs> Hawaiian shirt dot party. He's got I it. I got it. He's got, He's got it. Shirts. He's the guy. Yeah, I'm the guy. He's when the guy. dot obsessed. party came up, and I was like, cool, party Hawaiian shirts. That'll be the business. Yeah, I love that. that. Yeah, I am like enamored by it's, new especially ideas. Especially for the years where we weren't making any money yeah. with oh, YouTube. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah, like, something else is gonna hit. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, alarm yeah, clocks. Yeah. Let's start an alarm clock. Yeah. <laughs> GetUpright.com. Uh -huh. Upright alarm clocks. Oh, Wake up really right. good. good. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, that's good. That's good. The amount of ideas are just, but I'm saying as a creator, when you're a creative person, you, you come up with the ideas and you're just like enamored by it. And then years, and if you have it in you to actually go, years and years and years of the daily practice of being a business owner, mm -hmm. then maybe it has a shot. But actually, I can only tell you that it has a small percentage of making it. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, and that's no the one crazy makes thing. It. That's the yeah. crazy thing is that as a YouTube creator, you have the idea, you're enamored, you make it, you edit it. Maybe it takes two weeks, maybe it takes three weeks if it's a hard video mm -hmm. to edit. You put it out and you're like, okay, cool. What's the next idea? You can't do that with starting a business. No. You cannot do that. You are now in it. This is like my little preview to what marriage is going to feel like. You know what I mean? It's like, wow. Wow, it felt really good when we when we committed to each other. And now we're a few years in and, yeah. well, that's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that feels different. And then you're like, well, how do we bloom here? And then you do. Because I will say, like, I, I have no... I have no regrets, ultimately. Have I regretted it before? Yes, I actually have. Because it's been the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And whenever something's the hardest thing you've ever done, like it's crying, it's like, it feels like a marriage, wow. Wow, it is. It is kind of like, you know. It, it's also why you have to pick your partners wisely. Wow, yeah. yeah. And, and it, that's mm -hmm. tough too because. It's hard to do. Yeah. It's hard and like, you know, there again, there are so many cooks in the kitchen and I mean, the Chamberlain Coffee team is phenomenal and like, you know, they are incredible. But there's there's so many personalities. Like it's never it's never going to be perfectly smooth sailing. When you're working with that many people all on the same thing, it gets complicated. There's Dude. politics there's totally. like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like- You're also co-parenting this thing. Fully co-parenting. Yeah. You're making something physical that just goes out into the world. <laughs> yes. Like, Maybe it's good. Maybe, Maybe it's, it's not. It's like, fully being a parent. Yeah. You're like, yeah. I'm not watching that thing <laughs> no. during the day. If whole, like, it, God, it's, it gets scary. Like, it's like, you know, because I don't have my hands on everything. No, neither does our CEO or right. our CMO or whoever. Like, we don't all have our hands on everything. And as a control freak, it's it's so tough. It can yeah. be really tough for me because, you know, or if things go wrong, it's like we all take the fall, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for if, sure. If one person makes a mistake. You all take the fall, but your name's on it. You take I a, really you take, take the fall. You take a very different fall. Yeah. Very different fall. It's true. Right? And I think sometimes that risk because that level of risk is uh, significant, but then you also have people who are working at the company and they're spending 100% of their time. Mm -hmm. You're only spending, you're spending 40% of your time on it. Mm -hmm. But you need an operator that understands that if they fuck up, it's your oh, name. Oh yeah. It's your name. It is also yeah. in some situations though, risky for the employees and the operators who get involved right, too. True. Because right, you could do they, anything. Because if I did something crazy yeah. and I shave my head, <laughs> right there it goes. And I'm on the front of People Magazine, right. like nude. Yeah. At Sunset Tower Hotel. Think, is that selling yeah. coffee? Yeah. Yeah. Probably would sell yeah. some coffee. Probably yeah, is. Actually, like there's this like. Yeah. No, I'm uh, <laughs> because no, I'm, you're at Sunset Tower and it's like a radical yeah, Hollywood yeah. vibe. <laughs> yeah, I'm like Maybe. I'm on I'm naked also, on business. Sunset Boulevard, but only holding a Chamberlain coffee cup, and my head is shaved. Yeah. Okay. 
Big sales the next big day. Big sales. Mark right. my word. Yeah, right. Um, that's the next campaign. That's right. the next campaign. Glad we uh, <laughs> found that idea here. So chic. Okay, don't give me ideas. Um, that would be kind of dope if someone recreated celebrity tabloid moments from the 90s you as know, a campaign. I've almost done something like this. Mm. In fact, we have, like we're going into, I have kind of a similar idea. It's different. It's less edgy. But it's similar. Okay. I, you'll see. Wow. It's not going to be that big of a deal. It's just going to be kind of fun, like vaguely kind of like amusing. And is that for Chamberlain Coffee? Yeah, or for Chamberlain Coffee going cool. to various retailers. Cool, I was cool. like, how can I make this cool? And then I came out with something kind of, I'm not spoiling it, but it's kind of in that world. Cool. God, I really crave. We'll see if it, if it hits that craving for, the, for yeah, that kind of yeah, campaign yeah, yeah, vibe. Yeah. I just crave like producing campaigns again. You should like, that's, do that. That's like, I just yeah. crave it. Like I love It's so that fun. Thought. And like pro physical product is such a great opportunity to totally. do it. I think especially yeah. for people like us who spend so much time with digital video, digital yeah. numbers. Like mm -hmm. the, even when we meet someone who's wearing one of our hats, like the feeling is just so different. Yeah, it's, it's so unbelievable. Than a viewer, when yeah. someone's like choosing to go into a physical space yeah. with something that represents us, it's just such yeah. a different totally. feeling. Totally. What do you think about just the state of YouTube at the moment, someone who, you know, was very much a, a pioneer of, you know, making YouTube videos and, and content that was based around like a personality. Like what do you, what is your POV on the state of YouTube at the moment? It is in such a state of limbo to me where there was this sort of renaissance during the sort of real era where everybody was vlogging, everybody was being themselves, myself included. And that was such a departure from the more weirdly produced content that was going around at the time, whether it was like comedy videos that were more like mm -hmm. written out, sketched out, stuff like that, or it was even younger, like teenage YouTubers setting up their rooms super, super perfect and doing like the perfect bedtime routine or doing the perfect haul, you know? Everything felt very manicured for a period of time. And then it sort of got like loose again. And it was like everybody, well, not again, I guess it became super raw. And then now, That's not really working anymore. Like what I'm watching on YouTube is is not YouTubers. Right. Like the era mm -hmm. of right. YouTubers. Right. I don't know. I, like that's that that might be done for now. I think we're in the moment. Like I've I've said this a few times, but I think we're in the moment of like videos, not creators, where yeah. everything is about videos. And like there could be a week where a creator, a relatively unknown creator, just makes a video that gets five million views. Yeah. But then they that that's the video of the moment and then we move on. Yeah. It's almost like we're reverting back to the lean back experience, which I know you didn't experience, mm -hmm. but I did growing up of television mm -hmm. where you just like turn it on and you're like, you tell me what's on today. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of like, hey, YouTube, hey, TikTok, hey, you know, just tell me what's on. Yep. Show me what's on today. Mm -hmm. Rather than me seeking out. You like, with you, I think you, Casey and Dobrik mm -hmm. were like a different chapter where I sought out creators to watch, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think today when I open YouTube, I'm just like, yeah, what's, show me, what's going on? That's how I consume it as well. And I'm still an avid YouTube watcher. Like there are a few, like, I'm trying to think if I even know their names. Like there are some YouTubers who like consistently come up, but I don't even know their name. Yeah. It reminds me of music on Spotify where I know so many songs now. But you yeah. don't know the artist. Probably name. don't know the name of the artist and I definitely wouldn't that's recognize them if they comparison. walked right in front of me. Absolutely not. That's so God, true. That's so Being good. a musician is kind of, actually that's a terrible industry. I would hate to go into that industry. Yeah. Sounds, that sounds I was incredibly about to say, difficult. It's kind of nice because you get your songs like added to a playlist, but then like you, yeah, you get yeah, to yeah, kind of yeah. chill out. Like nobody knows your face necessarily if you don't want them to, but yeah. ultimately that would be terrible. And I really wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, I don't envy the, and you know, not to say, I think we're still kind of like establishing ourselves, but I don't envy the people who are just starting out now. I think it's so much harder now to figure it out because the signals you get are very different. 
like the signal of a viral video is very yeah. different today than it used to be. And it doesn't mean as much that like you can capitalize on that momentum. Like I don't, it all, you have to be so sure of what you're creating so you don't get informed by signals yeah. like viewership or, you know, certain things that can really impact you as a creative person. It has to be yeah. prioritizing brand over views for a long period of time, which is difficult for people to do. So I've been seeing a lot of like, for the first time in my career, a lot of <laughs> and even on Instagram, like I, my growth is negative. Like I'm not growing on Instagram and, and I understand why. Like I'm definitely in a phase where <laughs> I'm shifting audiences a little bit in a way because I'm changing what I'm putting out. And so I think my audience is changing. It's almost been like a euphoric experience to watch that happen and to say, that's okay. Like, I don't care. Yeah. Because yeah. I think we all fear that moment when, like, there's, like, either a plateau, like, a serious plateau or, like, even a moment of of decline. And yeah. I'm experiencing that right now. <laughs> and it's, by the way, hey, let me tell all y'all, it's totally fine. And, I mean, not only because that's not, like, it, it doesn't mean that you can't have a moment of growth again later, but... Also because it makes, it, it shows me that I'm making decisions for my own creative fulfillment and well-being. Mm -hmm. I'm not making decisions to grow. Yeah. I'm not making decisions to become more well-known, more famous. I'm making decisions based on what I just genuinely want to do. And I'm taking a break from various other things to explore other area, other categories of, of showbiz secretly, and that's my business, and show that's business, and that baby. show business, and that's yeah. that's my business. That's fucking show business. <laughs> that's fucking show, show business. business, baby. <laughs> and so you know, like, but it's like it's okay to. I don't think like. It's not failure. I really yeah. don't think it's failure. Yeah. But you're also at a we we have another term, I'm throwing so much vocabulary Please. at you, but um, post-platform. Post-platform yeah. is a term we use for creators like yourself who just really, you do not, like, you deleted your TikTok, doesn't matter. You know, like, yeah. you could not post another thing on Instagram or YouTube this year or for the next 12 months, doesn't matter. Oh, see, I don't know. I think so. I think, I think then when you post and come back, it's not like people, like, you still exist. In the world. As a human, you're a real, like, yeah, you still yeah, exist. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that? <laughs> right. That I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, the, the, the brand of Emma Chamberlain exists whether or not you're posting, in my opinion. Yeah. Do, you, do you agree with that? Like, if you stopped your podcast specifically, which is two times a week, mm -hmm. would you still feel comfortable with what you're putting out? Like if I stop with my podcast? Yeah, so you stop yeah. your podcast. No. No YouTube, no podcast. Well, I would have so much time. <laughs> yeah, I'd be so do? fucking bored, I'd have to make something. <laughs> my podcast does take up, that is a time, honestly, now that I'm thinking about my earlier split, podcast might be, it might be actually 50, 40, 10. What was the 10 again? I don't remember. Now. The 10 was like, Photo shoots. Doing a photo, oh, photo shoot shoots. or doing yeah, like yeah, this, yeah, what yeah, we're doing yeah. today or like little things like that. That's like 10. That's barely anything. And is podcasting the lion's share of your income right now? Oh yeah. That yeah. is like, that is, that is how That I, is how you make money. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. Like you're a podcaster. Fully. Do you connect with that identity of like, I'm a podcaster? I totally do. But I think people don't, like I do. Yeah. And I think I'm like, I, I love podcasting to be honest. Yeah. I love it, it is so also much. very hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I like, which is so well, crazy. You're, you're doing Hard it in, a, in the way that yeah, you do it. The way that you like, do it is also very specific. Like you have a solo podcast. Well, right. You're it doesn't talking, need to be hard. <laughs> but like, yeah. the, like I'm sure the interviews are different from the solo podcast. Well, the interviews are way easier. Right. Because I mean, it's like I'm, they're not way easier, actually. Depends on who I'm, uh, who I'm interviewing. My interviews tend to be easy because I'm interviewing somebody who knows a lot about something that I'm interested in. And you're genuinely curious. And I'm genuinely yeah. curious. So it's like, I just get to sit back and listen. It's, it's hard amazing. when you're not interested. Like when you're sitting on the side of a table and you're talking to someone and you're like, mm, I'm actually- That's why I can't yeah. do yeah. those people. Right. I can't. Yeah. I Like it's, it's, Would I can only interview, yeah. Only yeah. people who yeah, are yeah. fascinating to me. Would you ever take the podcast on tour? What do you mean? 
like uh, Alex Cooper is doing it right now with Caller Daddy. Like, oh, you go like around, going, taking yeah, it around. Yeah. yeah. Or as they say in the biz, take the show on the road. Take the show on the is road. Is she doing like live shows? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I mean, it would, yeah, because so you, you'd have to do that in an interview setting. That's like my the nightmare. Be, the beauty of your show. <laughs> Ultimately. That would be a one woman show. And yeah, it's all that's like on a you. one woman monologue. That's and honestly be, doing stand up. Yeah, that's yeah. stand up. But yeah, for yeah. me, it's like doing stand up about like, no. Also, going on tour, what a terrible lifestyle. Mm. It's not fun. We may or may not be about thinking it. about it. Okay, well, um, maybe we, we can offline about it and yeah, be like, yeah. I think that there's a way to do it that would make it fun. Actually, there's definitely a way to there's, do it that would make there's it fun. Defi- it, well, it's only fun if you think it's fun. <laughs> That's like, like if you don't want to do it, then yeah, it's definitely not fun. Well, see, I think like, I think for my show, for your both of your show, it would make so like to it would make so much sense. Yeah. And there's so much to do there. Yeah. Whereas with me, like, I think what makes my show feel the way it feels is the fact that it's me. completely comfortable in my own comfy space. I also do not, do not like public speaking. Mm, yeah. I'm not into it. I love it. Well, actually, it is can like I be a honest? a drug for me. Okay, see, it's like a drug for me, <laughs> but I'm like afraid of it beforehand. Like I get That's really I nervous. Feel. I have diarrhea, like I'm like fully like I think really... I'm gonna die. I'm like, <laughs> no, this I think is I'm gonna die too. Death of me. And I'm like getting a panic attack. I'm yeah. so, I'm uh, such an anxious person that like, I get so in my head. And then I'm on stage, I'm dissociating so bad. I'm like, <laughs> wow, where am I? Am I real? Can am I even talk? Like it's Whoa. it's so bad. So, but I do it and then afterwards I'm like, whoa, I'm powerful. Yeah. Same. Right, yeah. right, right. And then yeah. I feel incredible for the rest of the day. So I get off stage and I'm like, I'm not like other people. Exactly. <laughs> I am I'm on different. a stage. Well, I yeah. do TED I'm on talks, a stage. So I'm <laughs> different. In the seats. I'm yeah. different. Yeah. And then Fully. two weeks later we're doing public speaking again and I'm like, I'm gonna die. Back yeah. to square yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There is something really beautiful and I, I assume this for you about um uploading to RSS feeds where there's no public viewership. Oh. The absence of public viewership is so powerful. Like that is so incredibly powerful that, like it, it is odd. Like with Chamberlain Coffee, imagine if your revenue, like your PNL, was mm. just out in the open and everyone oh could just God. at all oh my times God. Oh my God. That's look terrible. at your performance yeah. of like, how is the business doing? That is YouTube, right? Everyone looks at our most recent videos and they're like, how are those guys doing? It's public humiliation. It's, it's public. Like you, you know, you've looked at a creator, you know, in the past and like, oh, wow, their viewership's not the same as it was. Yep. Like you just make a snap. I wonder what's going on. I wonder yeah. how they're doing. You make yeah. a snap yeah. judgment yeah. where you're just like, huh. Well, people probably think that about me in some ways. Like people probably Maybe. think that about me and they're like, you know. I don't know. There was a well, time. I think people definitely did when you first stepped away from yeah, YouTube. That yeah, was like yeah, everyone yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're like, to me, it's still just amazing that again, that you can upload something that says bed with an image of <laughs> yeah. you in bed and millions of people want to watch it. See, that to I me is so that powerful. I don't know now. Like I, try I, it. and maybe I will try. Try it. I know. But I see, don't like, know. The thing is, when I try to turn on a camera, and be in front of a camera for YouTube. Like when I try to do a YouTube video, I filmed videos this summer and they're never gonna come out because there's something so strong in my intuition that's telling me not to that I f- would film yeah. a full video. I was, it made me, I had a psychological reaction to it. I became deeply depressed from Watching trying Watching back to, a video or just no, trying? No, just trying to even make one. Yeah. I, it was, I was, it's like I have a mental block almost. Or it's like going to the gym my, yeah. after not working out for a long time and you're just not where you used to be. It's not that. Okay. It's not that. It's I really cuz I'm better at it now. Oh, interesting. It's not even that. It's that in my gut I know I should not be making YouTube videos right now. It's it's like not what my soul needs. It's almost like spiritual. <laughs> like my intuition tells me what to do. Mm. And making a YouTube video is fighting against that intuition. And for some reason that I genuinely can't explain, my body is like rejecting, is like, stop. You don't wanna do this. You're doing this for the wrong reason. You're doing this because you feel like people are mad at you. 
Not because you want to do this. Not because you have something to say. You, sh you know what you want to do, which is explore various other things, other ways to create video. I love video creation yeah. to, with, you know, to every, like every step of the way being in it, like figuring out the pace of it, like figuring out how it's shot. Like I love every single step of the process that is not changed. I think what my intuition is trying to tell me is if you continue to make YouTube videos right now, you're going to miss something else. That's mm. in this same yeah, yeah, world. Yeah, 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 totally. That's different. Understood. Does that make sense? A hundred percent understood. Like, uh, uh, yeah. Because yeah. also the making a YouTube video is very different from video making. Totally. Because of the additional layer of the distribution of it and the outcome, mm -hmm. like the, the the viewership of it, the publishing a YouTube video is very different from making it. And mm -hmm. then like the the process of being in love with creating video, that is different. Mm -hmm. It's just a different thing. Um, and yeah. once you upload that first YouTube video, you're kind of probably gonna get back in, right? Of totally. That rhythm. Yeah. And YouTube will always be there too. Yeah, it's, you have a channel called Emma Chamberlain. Like you can just, in 10 years when you're 32 and you're just like, hey, I wanna make a YouTube I'm video. I'm a mommy vlogger I mean, now. I look, yeah. at, <laughs> I look at, with with Neistat, like he, he uploads like out of nowhere yeah. and it just, millions of people are there to, to watch it because. Totally. And I think you have the same thing where it's just like, yeah, if you upload, we're all gonna watch. Yeah. And it could be in six months, it could be in a year, it could be in two years, but. It just has to feel, it has to feel right. Yeah. Because here's the thing, something that doesn't feel right. I remember there's like a few times on my YouTube channel, I up, I uploaded a video when my intuition was telling me not to. Yeah. And you want to know what fucking happened? Hmm. Everyone hated me and those videos. Right. I tried to push through that intuition and it absolutely backfired. And for good reason, because I didn't listen to my intuition and take a break when I needed one. And that was like years and years ago, but not that people haven't hated me since because they probably have, but that was like dark. Cause it was, I was going against my intuition. Yeah. And people, most of the time when somebody's a fan of you, they're gonna want more, of course. For sure. So you almost, you can't listen to that voice because as much as we appreciate that voice, I want more from all of my favorite creatives. We all want that, right? Um, Can I tell you what I want from you right now? Please. <laughs> Not in this exact moment. Yes. And maybe it's premature. Okay. But I think what I would like is when I listen to your pod and there's just some of these lines that stick out to me, I really do. The reason why like, I, I consider you a writer right now, I would love a book with like, meditations on creativity. Wow, like I love that. Literally like just these kind of excerpts, similar to the Rick Rubin book. I don't know if you've, you've read that. I actually, it's on my bookshelf and okay. I have not read it. Check it but. out, even just open it and yeah. look around. Yeah. Or like I um, have this book called The Daily Stoic by mm -hmm. Ryan Holiday, which has like these meditations on stoicism every day. Mm -hmm. um, and like excerpts on creativity and I life love that. is what I would love from you. I, and, and in a physical, like tangible form. There's, there's some things there. There's some things there. And, and books specifically has been on my mind. Like in a way, again, that to me is a passion project. Yeah. Like I would never do that as like my main source of income. Sure. Yeah. But like a passion project, I'm like, that is so up my alley. I just think you need to, like, it's a timeless piece that mm -hmm. gets to sit forever. Yep. You know, like I look at books like Steal Like an Artist or you know, like a bunch of Seth Godin books. He has one called The Practice. Like, and I look at those and I sit on my shelf as like a representation of my identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that you have a, a, a series of thoughts that can be compiled into something like that. I, I have, I have, let's just say I have a Google Doc that vaguely resembles that, that but it's more like, it's all my podcast outlines from all, cause I really right, go in depth. Right. And it's like all of my inner workings. And I've, the reason why I started compiling them, cause I used to just delete them, which was so stupid. 
But luckily for the last like three years, I've been compiling them now. Mm. So I do not, I no longer, well, I guess it's two years, two years. I no longer delete them. And I'm compiling them because that is sort of like, I feel like those two things could go hand in hand. It's Definitely like, what, hand you know, hand. like yeah. wh what's going to, yeah. I mean, and I also like, I, what I'm excited about moving forward too is um, I like the idea of being able to creatively hibernate. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I I have not ever yet chosen a a space where that's normal. Like with podcasting for example, that's two a week. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought that the yeah, hamster yeah, wheel yeah. of YouTube was bad. <laughs> I mean, it's at least easier because if I'm really like emotionally exhausted, I can turn the camera off and just be like into the mic like I'm whatever. The outline process is the hardest part though, and that's what's like, yeah, you know, but that's also not on, that's similar to the editing process of a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. You're hibernating and you're like working on this thing. But you're, but you're not, you're super available. Like, I mean, yeah. even to, the, to an audience, right? And totally. I think there is something to how cool music is you know, or well, like I the, love that. Oh my God. Dropping an album. Being yeah. able to like go and drop an album and then like leave for six months and go live your six life. Six months, like years. Years yeah, even, years. yeah, yeah. And you're still relevant. Or even like being on a TV show, if you're an actor, like, yep. and you're, you were on, I don't know, The Office. And then you, I mean, The Office is an anomaly, but. Uh, totally. Or being in a movie. Like. Yeah. Gosling, Ryan Gosling. If you really track the amount of movies he's been in, in over the past 15 years, mm -hmm. it's not that many. Mm -hmm. But they were super iconic and he, you know, came, then went away. They yep. came, then went away. And like, yeah, yeah that cool is- to apply that to YouTube. Yeah. Of like, you're gone for a year mm -hmm. and you've taken the footage, you've made like eight episodes yeah. of some sort. I know. And then but people that's can- riddled in fear. That's like, riddled in fear. That's never, terrifying. But I think it's cool to do something that's like, people don't yeah. do that. I know. I mean, See, that's the thing. I, I like, I just, I, the, the problem is, I don't know what it is next. Like, I actually don't know. I have like so many different ideas. And what I've noticed is you can't, one day you wake up and it tell, and, and you know what it is. Like as a mm. creative person, I feel like. Yeah. One day you wake up and you're like, yep, I gotta do that. I have to do that. Buy that domain. Yeah. But I need mm -hmm. to buy that domain. <laughs> yeah, I need to sell alarm clocks. Yeah. Weirdunderwear.com <laughs> is mine, okay? Um, yeah, like, I just have had no, I've been on, I've not stopped. Yeah. People think that I did stop because I stopped just YouTube, but I supplemented with other things. Right. So it's like I've never been mm. off camera, off line, awesome. ever. Since I started, right? Like that's wild. Because the podcast is still, even though less people see it, um, it's still for me the same load in a lot of ways. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like the load has shifted and I've yet to like chill. So I'm trying to chill <laughs> in the areas that like like, I actually think my layout right now is really nice. Like, doing my podcast, doing Chamberlain Coffee, um, and then other random little passion projects on the side. For whatever reason, not doing YouTube for me is giving me the space that I need to figure out what's next in the video realm, period. Mm -hmm. Video as just a medium. Yeah. Yep. It's probably space from YouTube Studio too. Like that, I do think it's the space. From oh, that. my video's yeah. ten out of ten. Yeah. Great, yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. Great, YouTube. I'm gonna yeah, yeah. Just go bury my head somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I'll just, just yeah. I'm, I'm just obviously divorced. gonna delete my channel and archive everything. What have you? You're, you've been super open about mental health and burnout and like being that connected to the internet and sharing so much of yourself. Like, what have you learned about how to keep yourself mentally healthy? and do the, doing this career? Well, <laughs> <I would've, laughs> clearly not enough. <laughs> to be completely honest, like I, I mean, I was like born somewhat of yeah. a, um, 
I'm already an anxious and depressed person. Like I'm already, that's already who I am. I was that before. That does not go away no matter what good fortune comes. And I learned that very quickly. Uh, I do think that there are a lot of things about this industry that take an anxious and depressed person. And it's ironic too, because I, I started everything as a way to distract myself from my depression at the right. time. Mm -hmm. And then it was hard to admit to myself at a certain point, oh my God, this is making me, now this is making me depressed. Right. And it's the question of like, okay, well, then what the hell can I do? Like, am I just the broken one? Yes, but also, you know, it's understandable that this career path has come with a lot of psychological challenges. Like, yeah. that just makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the pressure is immense. Um, the fear, the constant fear, the feeling that you're being hunted at all times. Like, there's yeah, so yeah, many... Yeah things that are like next level that, um, you know, I lost my train of thought, but. How, how is the relationship to, to Spotify as a platform? Cause like you used to have the relationship with YouTube. Yeah. Like, is it, I, I don't know. Like, is it different? Like, what does it feel like to be like, yeah. a, Spot of, like a Spotify creator? Well, it's very different because, you know, I like Spotify and I have a deal, you right. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's very different because, you know, it's like they're the ones that are putting the ads on my show and I'm doing the ad reads. It, it like, and, and they're sort of paying me a salary almost. Yeah. So it's so much more, it's so much more comfortable for me um, because I, I'm not questioning like, okay, well, what if there's like, what will happen with AdSense? Like, yeah. I, you know, it's yeah. I'm not worried about AdSense, but I'm also working with Spotify more intimately, like as a platform. I worked somewhat intimately with YouTube as a platform when I got to a certain level, you know, we started to build a relationship, but YouTube is is a platform, right? Like they they are not involved in like, like, Spotify, their their in house editors edit my show. Mm, interesting. You know, they do all the uploading for me. Mm. It, oh, so you like turn in the episode to yes. them? So basically, I turn in the episode to them. Um, they edit it, and in the way that the episodes are recorded, I don't even need to like review it because I already know. I say while I'm recording, like, okay, wait, cut that. Can you move this piece over here? Oh, man. So yeah, yeah. you know. It's, it's very like, but we, I recently hired a producer for my show. It, it was like, so it's been kind of scrappy. Well, like since day one, which I love, I, I prefer. That's the YouTube way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I, I work better that way. Um, but it's very different because they're involved in the creative process in a way too, because they're editing for me. Uh, they're, um, what about like the sets? Like, is that all you? So the main set is mine at home. Right. And that's just, you know, this sort of sofa bed that's in my office. Like anyone could do this setup. It's, it's not fancy at all. <laughs> you could order my microphone and my little recorder thing on Amazon. It like, it's all, the camera is like this, like literally scrappy. Again, it's a video camera like camcorder. And I like that camera because number one, it's reliable. And number two, it, it feels cozier. Like it feels cozier to me. Yeah. Like it being this sort of, it's one angle. It's just me sitting on this couch. And what I love about it too is that when... I'm not so focused on on the production of it all and the production's seamless. 
I'm able to actually provide something more valuable with my when I'm talking. Yeah. Because I'm not worried about all the other factors. Now, that works specifically for me in my show. Like that does not work for for everybody, but the the setup for the interviews is a bit more it's a bit more it's at the Spotify studio. Oh, cool. And they bring it in. They like build it every time I do an interview no in there. Way. They'll like wow. build it into an existing studio. Oh, interesting. And I sort of designed this set, right? I was like, I want it to feel like kind of cozy grandma's house. Um, and it works perfectly for interviews. I wouldn't want to bring people into that, my little room. Like right, yeah. it, it allows my show. It's like I named anything goes, anything goes because I wanted to be able to do anything I wanted mm -hmm, because it's, it's, yeah. I, 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 I've created something that at least in my eyes feels like a blank canvas every single time I sit down to, to record. Um, and there is definitely like a through line. Like it all is very, it seems like there's a theme to it. Uh, but the reason for that is because it's just what I'm thinking about right now, you know? Yeah, I think that's smart. I mean, even for us, we considered changing the name of our main channel. Like we would find a format that we kind of liked. We had a show called The Breakdown. It was yeah. like an analytical essay show. And we were like, let's change the channel to The Breakdown because like this is what we are. Like this is the thing. Yeah. And we didn't. And I think it's one of the best things we ever did because it allowed yes. us to be flexible. And you know, now we have like two, three hour long podcast episodes. That's not what our channel was two years ago. Totally. And it might not be what it is two years Next from year. Now. Like it's, totally. I think that's yeah. so great that- you but can do you that. both feel comfortable because it's just, it, it, you both feel comfortable because I think a lot of of creators like get in their own heads about what they are. Mm. Yeah, I mean, of course. Totally. We, you know yeah, what we I mean? definitely do. We of definitely course, do. Yeah. Sometimes I have to like too. write it down. I'm yeah. like, I am this or that, like, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, but it's also like, it's so much better to be like, all I am is me and what yeah. I put out is just, that's, the through line is me. Yeah. That's sort of been also my career philosophy. You know, it's just like the through line just has to be me. So whatever I'm doing, it it just has to feel like me. And then it, hopefully everything else will fall into place. That does get a lot harder when you like hire a team and build out like a production company. Because then all of a sudden it's like, it can be you, but it also has to be a version of you that provides for all these people. Totally. You know, and if you found that version of you, it's like, well then don't fuck that up. Like that's the version of you that provides. That's why I try <laughs> to make my money in areas that I control completely. Yeah. So like my podcast, for example, that is, so scrappy, it like I it it is literally I could do the show. I mean, obviously, I love doing the interviews, and that has been really exciting for me. But that is not the core of the show. Sure, the core of the show is me by myself. Yep. And if you didn't have access to Spotify's editing team, you could just edit the show. Yourself. Totally, it's fine. Like you yeah. know how to make that show. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I don't need <laughs> anyone. And also, I'm not. I don't have to. There's like I I don't. I'm not hiring anyone. Yeah. So it. it that g gives me this mental freedom where I'm like, oh, I can rely on this, like, cause it's all me. Uh, but I also am getting to a place where I need, I need to be team working a little more though. Yeah, yeah. Because I could be doing, Just number one, because I'm a social person more than I thought I was. And I'm realizing that again as an adult, I, I went through a phase where I was like, no, I, I do everything by myself. I'm this lone wolf. No, I'm not actually. You know, maybe I thought I was being the cool girl for saying that for a long time. But actually I, I do really enjoy working with others. And, and I think that there's a world where I can do both. And mm -hmm. like, I think, you know, my next chapter of projects, I think will include other people and will be, there will be maybe a, a slightly more intricate, intricate, like process of producing yeah. it. Yeah. You know? If you look back now, is there anything you would change? No. Not one thing. 
I, I, no. Because, I mean, I'm cringing at everything, right? Like, I look back yeah, and cringe you, at yeah, everything. You have to, yeah. But, <clears throat> I just don't even believe in, in, in the feeling of regret, almost, at times. I think regret is important when you do something really wrong in a way, but it, it doesn't really make sense here for me. Like for me, in, in my brain, I'm like, why would I regret any of this? Yeah. I, I, it, it, and even when I have made mistakes, I don't regret making the mistake because I'm such a firm believer in, you know, using those experiences to just make you better and more dynamic and mm -hmm. like, you know, mm -hmm. to, so I regret nothing. If you were going to teach something at a university, what would you be excited and able to teach? Honestly, like right now, I feel like I just, I love, I'm so obsessed with li like like living a really good life and like finding the way to do that and I feel like I've had personal experiences that have debunked what we all think a good life is in a way like I have like my dream career and I'm healthy and my parents are healthy and I have a great relationship with them and I have incredible friends and like an incredible team. Like I have such a great life. And, but that's not enough. Like, like you, you have to, Be like you have. There's things that you have to do to make all of that good. Does that make sense? Like yeah. I, and I'm so obsessed with that. And that's like all I don't want to talk yeah. about on my podcast is figuring out how do we how do we have the happiest life possible. And the tr I mean that's actually a whole not even happiest. How do we live the most fulfilling life possible? Happiest, I hate that. Because it's like, that's actually sure. not necessarily a good thing. There's going to be yeah. natural ups and downs. You oh, have yeah. to yeah. have a lot of downs or else you're yeah. not going to learn anything. And then, again, you're not living a, a full yeah. life. Um, so maybe I'd t uh, teach a class about that. But see, I would rather take a class about that. If I were to te teach a class about anything, it would probably be like, How to edit a YouTube video in a way that's so annoying for anyone above <laughs> age 17. <laughs> how to keyframe the shit out yeah, of this video. Yeah. How yeah. to t spend 30, 30 hours editing a video <laughs> that no one over 17 could stomach. Yeah. Okay, so here's what you do. Um, that's a good question. Um, well, I'm just so grateful for you to sit down with us for this amount of time. Yeah. Like this has, been, really this has been something that we've talked about for years, um, getting to do this though. Like I, I mentioned to you, like we're very nostalgic people. Like I felt in the middle of this conversation, nostalgic for this conversation. Stop. Um, but it was, it was really special. And I think for those people who are here at the end uh, with us, like very, very special relationship to those people. And this is the thing that having a interview show has I'm just so happy about that it creates these relationships that we get to, yes. mm -hmm. you know, like the conversations now we get to have off mic are going to be really cool. And like the, just, totally. it's just a cool relationship that gets built. So I'm yeah. so grateful. I mean, this is such like a, such a new type of conversation for me. And, and obviously I'm just such a big fan. So it's just, it's always so magical. Mm to do these things. And we are gonna like in a week be like, oh, we're gonna get nostalgic. <laughs> remember that we're time. all yeah. nostalgic. Yeah, remember that time? Yeah, but yeah. we're gonna have to do it again. Yeah, yeah. we'll do a part two. We'll do a part yeah. two. We'll do a part two. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you, Emma, for coming. Thank, thank you, you for listening. Um, and we'll see you for part two. Yes! Woo!